Good afternoon. I'd like to ask the interpreter currently on the Spanish channel to commence translation of the meeting. For those just joining the meeting, live translation in Spanish is available and members of the public or staff wishing to listen in Spanish can join the Spanish channel by clicking on the interpretation icon in the Zoom toolbar. It looks like a globe. Once you join the Spanish channel, we recommend you shut off the main audio so that you only hear the Spanish translation. Pablo, will you please restate this in Spanish? Bienvenidos a la reunión. Para los que recién se unen, interpretación en vivo al español está disponible y cualquier miembro o personal que desee escuchar en español podrá unirse al canal. Para unirse, haga clic en el icono de interpretación que aparece en la barra de funciones de Zoom como un globo traqueo. Una vez se une al canal de español, se recomienda que apague el audio primario para solo escuchar la interpretación al español. Welcome everyone to our May March 5th, 2024 City Council meeting. The time is 3.01 and seeing a quorum, we'll begin the meeting. Madam City Clerk, will you please call the roll? Thank you, Vice Mayor. Councilmember Rogers. Councilmember Okrepke. Here. Councilmember McDonald. Here. Councilmember Fleming. Here. Councilmember Alvarez. Present. Vice Mayor Stapp. Here. And Mayor Rogers is absent this evening. Let the record show that all council members are present with the exception of Mayor Rogers and Councilmember Chris Rogers. Excellent. We'll move on to item 3.1, uh, our, our closed session item, our conference with labor negotiators. Uh, Madam City Clerk, will you please conduct public comment on this item? Thank you. We are now taking public comments on item 3.1, conference with labor negotiators. I do have a public commenter from the council chamber and I will go ahead and turn it over to Mr. DeWitt at the podium. Hello, my name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland. In your <clears throat> negotiations with employees, I'm hoping that you will make a point of giving the hardworking lower paid employees in the Parks and Recreations Department and the Transportation and Public Works Departments and the other areas who are the, I guess you'd say, hands-on, boots-on-the-ground type employees keeping our city running, especially during these hazardous storms where many potholes are appearing everywhere. These are hardworking people and it's really important that you not just nickel and dime them to try to save on expenses while you've been giving big raises to the upper management people. They can see that and they're looking at it going, wait a minute, it's us doing this hard work here. And I really believe that what you could be doing is negotiating with them in good faith to make sure that they get a comparable wage increase based on what you give to the management people. I've actually seen where the management people are bringing in really large amounts of money now and these people down at the bottom who are doing the most of the work out there in our areas seem to be uh, basically considered second class and that's not the way it should be. It's especially important for maintenance and utility system operators, those folks there, they're keeping everything running while it's uh, storming and power outages, things of that nature. So please keep all that in mind. It's not to detract from the work of the management people. It's just to basically say that the people who they manage should also be perhaps considered on an equal footing in terms of pay and benefit packages. Thank you very kindly. Look forward to seeing you later in the meeting. Bye now. Vice Mayor, I see no one else approaching the podiums for public comment on this item. Thank you. And with that, we will, we will recess into closed session.
Thank you. Thank you for your patience, everyone, and welcome to our March 5th, 2024 City Council meeting. Seeing a quorum, we will reconvene after our closed session. Closed session, rather. Madam City Clerk, would you please call, call the roll? Thank you, Councilmember Stapp, or Vice Mayor Stapp. Councilmember Rogers. Councilmember Okrepke. Here. Councilmember McDonald. Here. Councilmember Fleming. Here. Councilmember Alvarez. Present. Vice Mayor Stapp. Here. And Mayor Rogers is absent. So I will let the record show that all council members are present with the exception of Vice, or pardon me, Mayor Rogers and Councilmember Rogers. Thank you very much. All right, we have no study sessions today. So we'll, we'll move on to item six, a report on closed sessions. Madam City Attorney. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, there was a closed session as outlined in item 3.1, I believe, and there is no reportable action from closed session. Thank you. Madam City Clerk, would you please conduct public comment? As there was no reportable action, we do not need to take public comment on this item. Never mind. Thank, Thank you. you. Moving on. Moving on to item seven, uh, our proclamations and presentations. Um, starting with uh, with item seven point one, Red Cross Month. Councilmember Alvarez. Thank you, Vice Mayor. And this is a proclamation for the Red Cross. Whereas, during American Red Cross Month in March, we recognize the compassion of the people in Santa Rosa and reaffirm our commitment to care for one another in times of crisis. And whereas, this generous spirit is woven in the fabric of our community and advances the humanitarian legacy of American Red Cross founder Clara Barton, who nobly dedicated herself to alleviating suffering. And whereas, today, Kind-hearted individuals in our community exemplify Barnes' commitment as they step up through the Red Cross in the Northern California coastal region to provide a beacon of hope for our neighbors in need. Through their voluntary and selfless contributions, they make a life-saving difference in people's darkest hours, whether it's delivering shelter, food, and comfort during disasters, providing critical blood donations for hospital patients, supporting military families, veterans and caregivers through the unique challenge of service, saving lives with first aid, CPR, and other skills, or delivering aid and reconnecting loved ones separated by a global crisis. And whereas, we her hereby recognize this month of March in honor of all those who lead with their hearts to serve people in need, and we ask everyone to join in this commitment to strengthen our community. Now, therefore, our Mayor Nally Rogers, by virtue of the authority vested in her by the laws of the city of Santa Rosa and the state of California to hereby proclaim March 2024 as Red Cross Month. I encourage all citizens of Santa Rosa to reach out and support its humanitarian mission. In witness whereof, she hereunto set by her hand this fifth day of March in the year 2024 in the city of Santa Rosa, California. Thank you. Thank you very much. And before going to our recipients, Madam City Clerk, would you, would you mind facilitating public comment? Thank you. We are now taking public comments on item 7.1, the proclamation for Red Cross. If you are in the chamber and would like to provide comment but have not provided a speaker card or your name, please make your way to the podium. You will have two minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that podium. Vice Mayor, I'm seeing no one approach the podium for public comment on this item, so. Well, he's the recipient of the proclamation. I was gonna, uh, uh, through the Vice Mayor, he was going to provide public comment. It looks like we have one, one individual. Mr. Ells, would you like to speak on public comment for non-agenda, or for 7.1? The Red Cross has a, a tremendous history uh, going back to um, uh, the princes of Austria and before that uh, to the uh, Knights Hospitaller uh, from, uh, of Jerusalem and from Rhodes on Malta. And uh, so uh, they have a tremendous history. 
of 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 exactly that hospitality and helping and then through the the princesses of Austria uh, they uh, created they became uh, nurses and that's the first nursing and and so on it was uh, essentially uh, connected to um, I believe it's Joan of Arc but uh, at any rate they're wonderful and throughout the United States and do a lot of emergency help and I want to thank them Good afternoon. My name is Chivas Moore. I'm a resident of Santa Rosa. And I would like to suggest that you add the Red Crescent to this uh, resolution honoring the Red Cross. The Red Crescent is the equivalent of the Red Cross in areas like the Middle East, so-called so Palestine, Gaza, today, so it would be appropriate, in my opinion, if you could add that. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to provide public comment on 7.1, the Red Cross Proclamation? Vice Mayor, seeing none, I'll turn it back to you. Wonderful. Then I'd like to invite the recipients to uh, make their way to the podium, and then afterwards, if you wouldn't mind coming down so we can take a photo together. Uh, good afternoon, Council. It's nice to be here. We appreciate the, the opportunity. Uh, in response to the last lady, this is uh, American Red Cross Month. Uh, we know that the Red Crescent does work in the Middle East and other parts, and there are other international Red Cross uh, organizations that work around the world. But this is American Red Cross Month. The proclamation was first made over 80 years ago by Franklin Roosevelt. Every president since Franklin Roosevelt has declared March of every year to be Red Cross Month. We're glad that uh, the city of Santa Rosa is joining uh, in that uh, celebration. Red Cross, as you all know, responds to disasters around the country, not only like the wildfires in Texas and uh, Oklahoma, where many of our Red Cross volunteers from uh, Sonoma County and California are right now working with the people who are victims of those fires, but also home fires that occur in Santa Rosa and other parts of Sonoma County. And people, uh, fire departments always call the Red Cross to come and offer assistance to the victims of, of those fires. In addition, we uh, do Red Cross, we do uh, blood collection. Uh, Red Cross is the primary, primary supplier of blood to hospitals for people who come in from accidents, shootings, uh, transfusions, whatever they need. Um, if you'd like to help the American Red Cross, you can donate blood at our office. Uh, you can find out when those are by going to redcross.org. Uh, you can volunteer your time or your money, and we appreciate all of the assistance from the citizens of San Rosa. I'd also like to introduce uh, Steve Contreras Otis, who is a member of the Red Cross board for Napa, Sonoma, Solano, and Marin counties. Good evening, City Council. Thank you for the proclamation. and. Uh, I'd like to add uh, to Andy uh, Woodholm's comments that the American Red Cross also provides services to the armed forces of the United States. And that's 24-7. They support families of deployed service members wherever they're stationed around the world. And then one other thing I'd like to mention is when you see a Red Cross person on the news or at a, at a disaster with a vest, that, that Red Cross volunteer is not paid. 90% of the people that s support the American Red Cross are not paid. They're volunteers. I want to point that out. And uh, thank you again for uh, the proclamation. Andy and Steve, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Please come down to the front with any other members of, of, of Red Cross and let's take a photo.
कर सकते We'll move on to item 7.2, our proclamation for Arbor Week. Council Member Fleming. <clears throat> Thank you, Vice Mayor. This is for Arbor Week. Whereas in 1872, a special day was set aside for the planting of trees, and this holiday called Arbor Day was first observed with the planting of more than one million trees, Arbor Day is now observed throughout the nation and the world. Since 1909, the state of California officially declared March 7th Arbor Day to commemorate the birthday of our very own Luther Burbank. And whereas in 2024, National Arbor Day falls on Friday, April 26th, and the city celebrates Arbor Day on March 9th with a tree planting event at Skyhawk Community Park as a service to our community and local school programs. And whereas trees protect our environmental resources, reduce erosion of topsoil, cut heating and cooling costs, moderate the temperature, clean the air, produce oxygen, provide habitat for wildlife, and support our city's economic development by increasing property values, beautifying our community, and enhancing the vitality of business areas. Whereas the interests in strengthening community image and sense of place through the preservation of and dedication to Santa Rosa's urban forests have been a major goal and commitment since the city's founding, Santa Rosa has been recognized as Tree City USA by the National Arbor Day Foundation for over 40 years and desires to continue its tree planting ways. And whereas trees are terrific in all shapes and sizes. I love that. <laughs> so be resolved that the mayor of the city of Santa Rosa hereby proclaims March 3rd to March 9th of 2024 Arbor Week. What say you? Yeah, all right. Thank you. Madam City Clerk, would you please conduct public comment? Thank you. We are now taking public comments on item 7.2. If you are in the chamber and would like to comment but have not yet provided your speaker card or your name, please make your way to the podium. You will have two minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. We do have one name submitted so far and we'll start with that submitted name. Mr. DeWitt, please go ahead. Please. Certainly. Hello, my name is Dwayne DeWitt, I'm from Roseland. Thank you to the city crews that help us with the trees. This book right here is from over 32 years ago and it basically pointed out that tree planting is a very important thing for communities. I really want to see us have even more employees in our parks and recreation departments and in our tree crews. Basically, we need to do more as soon as possible to help get even more trees in. I've been told that a lot of trees were knocked down in the recent storms, and because of that, we're behind an eight ball in a sense. One of the things that happens when a tree, especially a very large tree that's been around for a long time, helping to sequester carbon is knocked down, it's very difficult to replace its helpfulness. It takes years and years for trees to grow. So I'd like to <clears throat> see you folks there on the podium Take it upon yourself to help our employees that are already with the city to do even more. We used to have an actual arborist at the city, and that position uh, was not filled in the past. It would really be a nice thing to do that again, perhaps. But if you can't, do more with the people that are already here, helping them to get more assistance. There'd be a great way to do it with students from Sonoma State and Santa Rosa Junior College and help them to work on our crews here and perhaps become interns to learn how they could get full-time positions working with city and county government on this very important resource, our trees. I'll leave you with this. A woman said over 140 years ago, we all want quiet, we all want beauty, we all need space, and it all goes better with trees. She's one of the people that coined the term neighbor woods. Thank you kindly for your time today. Thank you. We'll go to the next speaker at the podium on the east lectern. And while I applaud planting trees, I'm dismayed by how many um, invasive non-native trees are being planted. Um, recently, the um, city is beautifying uh, Santa Rosa Avenue and planted along the entire strip of three blocks 
ginkgos. Ginkgo trees are terrible. They make a big mess. Their leaves are slippery, and they're actually quite dangerous when they do their with, leaf with, drops. With, with apologies for interrupting, would you mind uh, leaning just a little closer to the mic so the people can you hear, hear me you? now? Perfect, thank yeah, you. Yeah, so the problem I have is the lack of native trees. If we're going to be planting trees, they should be native trees. Native trees support habitat. Um, the strip along Santa Rosa Avenue are all ginkgos, and ginkgos are super problematic tree. So I would just like to see more native trees being planted. Thank you. Thank you to the West Lector, Mr. Ailes, go ahead. Do forgive me, I speak sometimes without things that are in the future and things that are urgent now and some things from the past. Uh, do forgive me though. Uh, in regard to the Arbor Day, it's really great obviously to remember Luther Burbank as any time we can do that is fantastic. He was just incredible. Um, but recent studies uh, in Australia and, and in South Africa and, and places uh, that are, uh, are desiccating, what they're finding is that the removal of trees is really, really detrimental to the groundwater, preserving the groundwater. And so we can benefit the groundwater by having more trees. We should have more trees and the shade actually changes the whole micro uh, climate and uh, so much better for the city and much better for really actually uh, changes a lot of things for the groundwater. So it'd be, when you think of things with groundwater, we should really be thinking of trees. And one other aspect is that we have this demonstration forest. I mentioned that on the day of the air conditioning question for the library with the, with the librarian, the, the uh, director of the library. And I think they took some action on that. But there's a demonstration forest over here that they have no idea what to do with that. And it's a fully grown forest. So when Dwayne talks about the time for these trees, these trees are fully grown. They could be used here at this library. They could be used over at the Northwest Library. They could be used around town where they could be replanted. And they're fully grown 60 foot tall trees. Uh, they can be replanted and so if they were, they really change the microclimate around them and, and really benefit the community with shade and so a lot of aspects of shade, but particularly the groundwater. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Stapp. I see no additional people approaching the podium for public comment on 7.2. Thank you. And are we welcoming the city's own Jen Santos to the microphone? To receive, to receive the proclamation. Um, and while she's making her way up there, um, while she's making her, while they're making their way down, I'll just thank all the members of Parks and Rec who, Rec who came today. It's nice to see that we have a, we have a full squad. Thanks for all that you do. Thanks so much for this proclamation today. I'm Jen Santos, Deputy Director for uh, Recreation and Parks. And I have with me today our Park Superintendent, who we want to definitely invite people out to our volunteer event this weekend. So I wanted to take this moment and uh, talk about that. It's a really good event. Vice Mayor Stapp, Council Members, my name is James Castro. I'm the Superintendent for Parks. Uh, as Jen said, we are holding a Arbor Day event this Saturday, March 9th from 9 to 12 at Skyhawk Community Park. We're going to be planting over 30 trees. We hope everybody can join us. Um, I'd also like to take a moment to recognize the park maintenance staff uh, during this last storm that we had. Um, they responded to over 34 downed trees in a 16-hour time frame without a tree crew. So. Um, Cheers to you guys. Thanks for all that you do. And thank you guys. That, well, thank you very much. I, we want to invite everyone down to take a photo. Please, the whole team, come on down. If you can hear me, Pablo, would you like to switch for a minute?
And for our last proclamation of the e evening, item 7.3, National Women's History Month, Councilmember McDonald. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Thank you so much for the honor of reading this. I get to read the Women's History Month proclamation. Whereas women have played a critical role in shaping the economic, cultural, and social fabric of our society through their participation in the labor force, working both inside and outside the home, in leadership positions, and through creative inspiration. And whereas National Women's History Month provides an opportunity for schools and communities to increase the knowledge held by our children and our community of women's roles in history and their contributions to the development of this nation. And whereas the 2024 theme for National Women's History Month is women who advocate for equity, diversity, and inclusion, which directly recognizes the women throughout the country who understand that for a positive future, we need to eliminate bias and discrimination entirely for our lives and institutions. And whereas National Women's History Month is both a call to acknowledge outstanding women we know by name and to pay homage to the nameless women who shared our collective past. Now, there, now, therefore, be it resolved that our Mayor Natalie Rogers of the City of Santa Rosa, on behalf of the entire City Council, in recognition of the significant role played by women whose courage and vision inspire hope and possibility for today's women to make tomorrow's history, therefore proclaim the month of March 2024 as National Women's History Month in Santa Rosa. Thank you very much. Madam City Clerk, would you please conduct public comment? Thank you. We are now taking public comment on item 7.3. If you are in the chamber and would like to make a comment but have not yet provided a speaker card or your name, please make your way to the podium. You will have two minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. I'm seeing no... Oh. Speaker, please go ahead on 7.3 at the West Lectern. Yes. My name is Chivas Moore. I'm a resident of Santa Rosa, and I cannot help but remember the women who are outside the United States as well, and point out to you that the women in Gaza, for instance, are being killed by U.S. weapons and with U.S. money. Please take that into, cons to, into consideration when you're honoring women. Thank you. Thank you. The next public comment. Oh, there are no other members of the public wishing to provide public comment. Vice Mayor, I'll turn it back to you. Wonderful. And I think we have Melanie Jones Carter from the Commission on the Status of Women here tonight. My name is Melanie Jones Carter, and I'm the Vice Chair of the Commission on the Status of Women, appointed by Commissioner, sorry, Supervisor Chris Corsi. And with me is Anna Diaz. We would like to thank the council for taking this time to acknowledge the work done by, sorry, so, <laughs> oh, lost my place. We would like to thank the council for taking the time to acknowledge the work done by so many impactful women in Sonoma County. It's quite a coincidence that today is election day and so many women worked so hard for the right to vote in 1920. The commissioners are advisors to the Sonoma County Board of Supervisors and work to ensure that the issues impacting women and girls are given the necessary visibility to affect positive changes in public policy. This year, we have ad hoc committees focusing on reproductive rights, human trafficking, community engagement, and vo voter turnout. Feel free to reach out to the commission if you have need any assistance on issues that concern women and girls in Sonoma County. Again, thank you so much to the council for this proclamation. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie and Anna, for being here tonight. Do you want to come down and take a photo? Oh, Anna, did you, did you have, please go ahead. Hello. I just wanted to say one thing additional to everything that Vice Chair Jones had just mentioned. Uh, we would like to 
acknowledge the past women and founding sisters of the 19th Amendment that actually gave us the right to vote here today since today is election day. So I just wanted to honor all women here in Sonoma County and in America and in the whole nation. Thank you. And in God and and in the whole world. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Come on down. All right, we're moving along to item eight, staff briefings. Madam City Manager. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, this evening we have no staff briefings. Oh, th that's incorrect. We do have a staff briefing. We have the community empowerment plan update, and we also have an introduction of one of our new team members. are two of our new team members. Hi, <clears throat> good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, um, and City Council, Lon Peterson, Director of Communications, Intergovernment Relations. I'll be doing the uh, Community Empowerment Plan update this evening. Uh, so first, it's my pleasure to introduce two talented team members that recently joined our team. Uh, first on my right, a newly appointed diversity, equity, inclusion, and uh, equal employee opportunity officer, Francesca Roberson. Um, she has a solid background in DEI management and has played a pivotal role, pivotal role um, in implementing strategic DEI plans in her previous position. Um, her commitment to fostering inclusive workplaces um, is noteworthy. She has a certification in DEI program management and is a certified trainer. Um, next, on my left, joining um, the CERO team is newly appointed community engagement manager, Ana Horta. Um, as a bicultural and multilingual professional, Ana has worked in diverse populations in both Latin America as well as the United States. It's a proven track record um, of bringing people together from various socioeconomic, cultural, and ethnic backgrounds, um, and she has expertise in community engagement as well as program management. Um, moving forward, Anna will be the liaison to the Community Advisory Board. And so with that, please join me in welcoming Francesca as well as Anna to the team. Uh, one, one real quick thing, um, and I mentioned this previous, but the police department is developing a strategic plan and it's seeking community feedback and input um, and guidance on that. Uh, that first part of that is happening tomorrow, March 6, 6 p.m. at 35 Stony Point Road. The chief will host a community meeting um, to get input on public safety priorities. Um, in addition to that meeting, uh, the police department has launched a community partner survey um, that's b available in English as well as Spanish, seeking feedback on ex community experience with the police department, um, engagement interactive opportunities, as well as safety priorities. And so the survey is open till March 18th. And if you visit uh, SantaRosaPD.org, um, you can participate or take the survey. And that concludes the community empowerment update. And would you like to say something? 
City managers. Well, first, um, certainly acknowledging uh, Madam Mayor in your absence, Vice Mayor, and um, Madam. Oh, it up a little bit. okay. Hi. Okay. Certainly want to um, acknowledge Madam Mayor in her absence, Vice Mayor, and Madam City Manager, and our esteemed council members. I am just super excited to be part of the team here at the city of Santa Rosa. I look forward to moving the needle forward in the work that has already been started. And thank you for this opportunity. Good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council members, and Madam City Manager. I'm very excited to be here and to be part of the city and to really continue to work on serving our diverse community. Thank you. With that, that concludes the update. Thanks to all of you. And I'm sure I speak for my, my fellow council members when I say how fantastic it is to have both, both of our, our, our new staff members here. Thank you for, thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, and with that, Madam City Clerk, would you please come back to public comment? Thank you. We are now taking public comment on item 8.1. If you are in the chamber and would like to provide comment but have not provided a speaker card or your name, please make your way to the podium. You will have two minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. Vice Mayor, I'm seeing no one approach the podiums for public comment on 8.1. Thank you. Move on to item nine, the city managers and city attorney's reports. Madam city manager. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, I have no updates this evening. Thank you. Madam city attorney. And I have no updates as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right, move on to item 10, statements of abstention by council members. I'm looking at my colleagues. Any statements of abstentions? No statements of abstentions this evening. So then we'll move on to item 11, the mayor's and council members' reports. Any reports this evening from my, from my colleagues? All right, we're not a chatty bunch tonight. Uh, moving along to item 12, approval of minutes. Um, let's see, Madam City Clerk. Oh, sorry. I was I was distracted for a moment. Were there any any changes to be made on on the minutes? Again, none. Um, now I'll turn to Madison City Clerk. Uh, would you please conduct public comment? Thank you, Vice Mayor. We are now taking public comment on item 12.1, February 13th, 2024, regular meeting minutes. If you would like to provide comment but have not yet provided a speaker card or your name, please make your way to the podium. You will have two minutes, and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. Vice Mayor, I'm seeing no public comments or uh, people approaching the podiums for public comments. Thank you. So then I think I'm correct in just adopting the minutes as submitted. Is that correct? You are correct. Thank you. All right. Moving along to item 13, the consent items. Um, Madam City Clerk, would you please read the consent items? Certainly. Item 13.1, resolution, extension of proclamation of homeless emergency. Item 13.2, approval of professional services agreement with Disability Access Consultants, LLC. Item 13.3, resolution authorizing submittal of a grant application to the Wildlife Conservation Board for the Lower Colgan Creek Restoration Project, Phase 3. And that concludes the consent calendar. Apologies. Uh, looking to my colleagues. All right, Madam City Clerk, would you please conduct public comment? Thank you, Vice Mayor. We are now taking public comment on items 13.1 through 13.3, the consent calendar. If you are in the chamber and would like to provide comment but have not provided a speaker card or your name, please make your way to the podiums now. You'll have two minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. Mr. Ells, please go ahead. Thank you. I, I just wanted to thank the council for continuing the uh, uh, resolution of a homelessness emergency. There has been a reduction of homelessness in uh, Sonoma County due to, I think, a lot to do with 
the governor's uh, um, Sid's uh, home key and uh, there was another name for the other program. But my point is, is that many people have been in house through that, that program and there's been a lot of help. I know that I suppose the Sebastopol Inn is empty at this point. That's really problematic, but hopefully maybe SAY people have gotten in there. I, I, I think they have to have some construction or so. I don't know exactly what's going on with that, but it's not a city issue. But I just wanted to say that we're still in a homeless emergency, and I appreciate the city council's effort in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor, I'm seeing no one else approach the podiums for public comment on the consent calendar. Thank you. Council Member Krupke, may I have a motion? Yeah, I'll move items 13.1 through 13.3. Second. All right, we have a motion by Council Member Krupke and a second by Council Member Alvarez. Madam City Clerk, would you please call the vote? Thank you. Council Member Rogers is absent. Council Member Krupke? Aye. Council Member McDonald? Aye. Council Member Fleming? Aye. Council Member Alvarez? Aye. Vice Mayor Stapp? Aye. And Mayor Rogers is absent, so let the record show that this passes with five affirmative votes with Mayor Rogers and Council Member Rogers absent. Thank you very much. All right, we, seeing that it is not yet five o'clock, we're gonna have to hold off on item 14, public comment on non-agenda matters. Instead, we're gonna go, we're gonna go right away to item 15 point, or to item 15, report items. Um, item 15.1, a report on the resolution to approve citywide integrated pest management policy. Madam City Manager. I think we're good to go. Staff, come on down to the podium. Item 15.1, resolution to approve citywide integrated pest, pest management policy. And if you could just please introduce yourself for the record. And council, just so you know, we have uh, several team uh, members in the uh, audience to be able to answer questions. Good afternoon, Good afternoon, Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor Stapp and members of the City Council. My name is uh, Sean McNeil. I'm the Deputy Director of Environmental Services. And I'm here today with uh, Jen Santos and Paul Lowenthal to introduce to you the uh, Integrated Pest Management Policy. So the outline for today is uh, talk about the goals of integrated pest management, uh, which we believe that this policy before you um, meets, uh, go over some of the existing guide guidelines, uh, talk about the uh, typical integrated pest management policy that ours was built off, and then our staff recommendations. Before we get started, we'd like to start with some definitions just to make sure that we're, uh, as I'm saying these words, that you're having the similar uh, thoughts. Uh, so a pesticide is any chemical that's used to eradicate pests, includes herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, and ros rodenticides. Um, glyphosate is an, the active ingredient in a, a widely known commercial product called Roundup. It's recognized as an effective herbicide. Uh, the various trade names for glyphosate are based on the types of applications that they are approved for. Uh, so there's many different compounds that are, are many different formulations that are covered by um, our glyphosate ban as we identify in our um, integrated pest management policy. And then neonicotinoids are a broad spectrum group of pesticides, um, insecticides that kill more than the intended species. And it has been shown to have dramatic effect on bee populations and that's why there's been a lot of movement uh, throughout the country to um, reduce the use of these um, insecticides. 
reasons to decrease pesticide use. Um, pesticides and fertilizers were used to help launch the green revolution. Uh, this has been used to increase crop yields, preventing hundreds of millions of people from starving. Uh, but then pesticide use began to have significant environmental impacts as they were overused in our environment. They killed non-target species and were linked to human health impacts. Specifically concerns with glyphosate is that um, the chemicals persist in the environment for days or months, depending on the formulation and uh, frequency of uh, use. And they're widely used in uh, agriculture and landscape maintenance. Um, it has been listed as a probable carcinogen by the International Agency for Research on Cancer. And lawsuits have been filed and won against the chemical manufacturer of um, glyphosate. And the health risks are most acute to the pesticide applicator. And I believe our policy covers um, protection for our applicators as well. <clears throat> So integrated pest management, the goal is to, uh, of this policy was to develop a citywide integrated uh, pest management policy, which you have before you today. This policy would provide guidance to staff and contractors working for the city to ensure that the landscapes are designed and maintained in a manner that reduces the need for fossil fuel powered equipment, herbicides, insecticides, and other anthropomorphic inputs that have an ability to exacerbate climate change and also to ensure that the policy supports um, the city's ability to protect against increased fire severity due to invasive species and climate change. So I think the policy covers, um, threads the needle on, on meeting those goals. So our integrated pest management policy really starts with pest identification. You need to identify these pests, uh, research the least toxic methods to address the impacts of these pests. And if action is needed, apply the least toxic methods first uh, and then evaluate. And if further action is needed, apply the next uh, least toxic method. So any integrated pest management policy is going to start with non-pesticide actions first, planting spaces with dense plantings, talk a little bit more about that in a minute, uh, mechanical removal of weeds where possible or uh, our other plant pathogens, uh, avoid problematic species where possible, and use pesticides as a last resort in following a least toxic approach first. So pest management solutions for insects, uh, first you have to wonder, can you tolerate this amount of insect? You know, aphids a good example. Many plants can be fine with aph aphids on them. Uh, you identify the disease. Is this a disease that's going to really kill this plant or is it just going to retard growth a little bit? Um, can mechanical removal of these uh, pests work? Um, if not, then you might need to spray with an appropriate pesticide to protect the uh, plants. Um, and if that doesn't work, uh, replace that uh, type of plant with pest resistant species. Uh, where this doesn't work is in Luther Burbank Gardens where we are um, growing specific uh, heirloom varieties uh, to be period uh, specific with uh, um, Luther Burbank's time in his plant development. Pest management solutions for weeds, um, tolerate. There's a certain amount of weeds that we can tolerate. Uh, we can also make sure that our landscapes have high density plantings which outcompete the space for the weeds. Um, mulching areas that aren't as densely planted with three inches of mulch uh, can help prevent weeds from growing. Uh, then mechanical removal. Uh, where weed tolerance is, is allowed, uh, and then in large open spaces looking towards grazing and other um, uh, removal, and then uh, herbicides as a last resort. Also, the pest management, uh, the integrated pest management policy address plant, um, pest management solutions for plant diseases. Uh, first, again, it's very similar. Uh, can you tolerate the damage? Uh, can you identify the disease? Make sure that if you are going to uh, try to eradicate the disease, you need to know what you're after uh, so that you can get the right tools. 
um, mechanical removal of the disease, probably one of the biggest diseases we have on, on fruit trees and uh, any plants in the rose family is fire blight. Uh, and the number one action for protecting those plants is to identify the disease early and cut the material away and get it out of the garden space. So, um, so that wouldn't require pesticides um, if you identified that. And then if you do need to use sprays, um, use appropriate pesticide and uh, use least toxic uh, ones first, like copper sulfate or sulfur. Uh, and then replace any uh, pest problematic species with pest resistant species. Um, and once again, uh, the landscapes in uh, Luther Burbank Gardens would need to, uh, to wouldn't be able to use that um, as easily because they're trying to preserve those species. The uh, draft, the policy before you uh, has a complete ban of neonicotinoids in the city, uh, minimize the use of all pesticides throughout the city using the, the policy, uh, and requires staff to have a certified pesticide applicator to apply or supervise staff who are applying. Uh, and then when spraying any pesticide, staff will use goggles chemical resistant clothing and chemical resistant gloves and chemical resistant boots. Uh, and these are above and beyond the minimum requirements uh, for many pesticides, but we thought in the policy to err on the side of safety. Uh, there is also in the um, policy a ban on glyphosate use in most sensitive areas. Uh, that would be playgrounds, public gathering spaces, picnic areas, and other areas with identified sensitive receptors uh, so that no glyphosate would be used in those areas, but that we would have some specific exceptions should conditions um, get out of control and we need to get them in, in alignment. Those exceptions to the glyphosate ban would be to allow an, uh, use in case of public health and safety, uh, allow use on road medians and parking structures where uh, the interaction with the, um, the environment is a lot less, uh, allow on ball fields that are closed for renovations. These are not active fields, so people wouldn't be out uh, recreating on them allow for use on invasive plants. Uh, this would only be for non-routine activities, uh, typically when uh, restoring, doing a, a, an ecological restoration of an area, you might need to use um, chemicals to get rid of the invasive plants uh, so that the newly installed um, native plants can have a chance uh, to compete. And then uh, in these cases, once the objectives are met, uh, that we would decrease or eliminate use of glyphosate in those areas completely. And to make sure that we're following through on that, uh, the policy calls for uh, transparency of our pesticide use. Uh, we would, the, the policy requires that we create a website to highlight activities to one, prevent uh, pesticide use, and that would have the, this exact policy, uh, tips for managing pests without pesticides, and then an annual report of our pesticide use on city properties. So there would be a, uh, an opportunity for the public and council to see how well the policy is doing to curtail our use of pesticides, and that all pesticide applications will be posted prior to listed date of application. And when planning to apply pesticides close to the area, uh, close the area to the public and post signs about pesticide application. So uh, it is the recommendation by uh, Santa Rosa Water and, Rec and the Recreation and Parks Department that the City Council, um, uh, the Council of the City of Santa Rosa by resolution adopt the citywide integrated pest management policy. That take any, open for any questions. Thank you very much. And I'm turning to, to council for questions. All right, really no questions. Well, let's go to uh, public comment then. Madam City Clerk. Thank you, Vice Mayor. We are now taking public comments on item 15.1. If you are in the chamber and would like to make comment but have not provided a speaker card or your name, please make your way to the podium. You will have two minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. Please go ahead, Mr. Ells.
working now? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I, I cannot thank the city and the city council enough for beginning on a process like this is really terrific. Both glyphosate and, and all these other pesticides, neonicotinoids and so on, really terrible for uh, the overall environment, particularly for, for the, the least of these, we'll call them the smallest of the animals. Um, I've mentioned before that, that I'm an environmental engineer and I've, I went through a, a postgraduate program in hazardous materials management of which it was all about toxics and so on. It was 1986. So it's high. I'm glad to see this. Um, and particularly the approaches, the least toxic approach first and then and replacing plants, I assume native plants are usually more uh, suited to the environment. Um, the question about tolerate disease, you can weaken the plants and have significant problems with that. I would, I would ask that you amend the, your proposal or at least look at some things, one of which is grandma putz methods. Use vinegar, dish soap, vegetable oil, and peppers of various varieties, black peppers, red peppers, green peppers, and you use the, the seeds from these peppers you put it, and they kill, uh, they'll kill ants if you have problems. It's certainly any, any um, uh, gnats or other types of things like that. It's really terrific to get those. They're very natural. They're not pesticides of any kind. I mean, they're not toxic from that standpoint. You need to use them very delicately. It's really but also to have an emergency, which I believe they're really considering, which is in case something, everything else doesn't work, that you can really take care of it and you need to. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker, please, at the West Lectern. Please go ahead. Hello, my name is Tess. I'm a lifelong Santa Rosa resident. I appreciate this um, proposed ban on certain chemical um, pesticides, but I very much dislike the page on exceptions, especially considering that I have three brothers who have all played baseball. Uh, I used to play softball and I would roll around in the grass. If I knew that there were chemicals thrown on that grass even a year or two years before I was on it, that would make me concerned. I'm a 24-year-old who has uh, lifelong chemicals, they call them forever chemicals because of the practices that our country has engaged in for putting pesticides in our um, agriculture and in our recreation areas. And this is not by my own choice. This is, you probably have forever chemicals and if you do not, your children probably do. So I think that there should be a further ban on these things. And like Thomas said, there are natural alternatives to take care of um, invasive species and different plants that we don't want. Like, I had the privilege last year to engage in a cultural burn with the North Fork Mono of the Awanichi Band from Yosemite, and I learned from them that the ways in which that we care for the earth is not how it has to be. If we put human power onto it, we can take care of these invasive species. So I really would like to encourage you to look past all pesticides, not just these few that are here, but all of them, like vinegar, water, peppers. So please, think about the children. We have lives that we want to live, and these pesticides, all of them, even the ones that have limited bans, affect us without us even choosing it. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker on the next, on the East Lectern, please go ahead. Uh, Susan Lamont, District 2. I also want to thank the council for, uh, um, or the <laughs> department for um, making this proposal, and I assume the council is going to accept it. Um, I also want to hold out the hope that you will eventually ban all pesticides. I'm a landscape designer, um, a permaculture uh, certificate holder, and there really are other ways to do this. And, you know, I had to spend a lot of time with some of my clients explaining to them that we do not control the earth and we do not control nature. And uh, we need to get over the fact that everything must be perfect. So, um, Thank you for this. But I'd also like to take the opportunity at the beginning of this um, presentation, the city clerk mentioned the audience. We are not an audience. An audience sits and does nothing but be entertained and might clap. 
We are the public. So I am hoping that from now on, the term audience will be banned, and you will now refer to this gathering as the public. Thank you. Vice Mayor, I'm seeing no one else approach the podium for public comment on item 15.1. I'll turn it back to you. Turning back to council for any final, final comments. Uh, well, then just let, let me extend our thanks to, to Sean, to Jen, to Paul. Uh, this is a very thoughtful proposal, and there's a lot of work that went behind it. Um, thank you also to our maintenance and parks and rec teams. I mean, one of the implications of this proposal is that, frankly, there's a lot more physical work for the, for the, for the folks that we have in the, in the community. Um, I'm, I myself have weeded an outfield, and it, it's not easy. So thank you, thank you for being willing to take on this extra work. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to Council Member Fleming for a motion. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I'll move a resolution of the City of Santa Rosa adopting a citywide integrated pest management policy and wait for the reading of the text. Second. All right, we have a motion from Council Member Fleming and a second from Council Member Krupke. Madam City Clerk, would you please call the roll? Thank you. Council Member Rogers is absent. Council Member Krupke? Aye. Council Member McDonald? Aye. Council Member Fleming? Aye. Council Member Alvarez? Aye. Vice Mayor Stapp? Aye. And Vice or Mayor Rogers is absent, so this passes with five affirmative votes with Mayor Rogers and Council Member Rogers absent. Thank you. All right, we're moving back up to item 14, public comment on non-agenda matters. Madam City Clerk. Thank you, Vice Mayor. We are now taking public comments on item 14, non-agenda matters. This is a time when any person may address the council on matters not listed on this agenda, but which are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the council. If you are in the chamber and would like to comment, but have not yet provided a speaker card, please provide your name to the administrator at the top of the well. We have already received 12 public comment cards for item 14. The remainder of those wishing to provide public comment on non-agenda matters will be afforded the opportunity to speak under item 18 non-agenda matters. The first public comment will be from Luann, followed by Roxy, then Duane. Lulu Lejoie. I feel that although I am a fairly new resident in beautiful Santa Rosa, I get that what is most important here is peace. The city of Santa Rosa proudly stands for diversity, welcoming all, and that inclusivity, in that inclusivity, there is tolerance in our hearts. The heart of Santa Rosa is vast reaching, and I know that its residents care about the world, care about the future. Our city stands for peace. We need to show the world that our caring doesn't stop at the city limits. I urge a vote for the ceasefire resolution. This stands for peace on both sides. It stands for an end to the killing of innocent lives we can make a difference and be an example to the youth in Santa Rosa and the world. And we can show that we believe in a future of peace. Cease fire now. Thank you. The next speaker will be Roxy, followed by Dwayne. Go ahead. OK, thank you. My name is Roxy Schilling. I was born in Santa Rosa. As a trans and queer person, I have been seen this city become more accepting of the LGBT community than when I was growing up. I know there has been progress in inclusivity and diversity in moving away from the racist past of this county, although there is much more work to be done. I would hope that you as representatives of the city, as political representatives of this country, would take a stand for human rights, would be able to say Palestinian lives matter, like many have learned to say black lives matter, would take a stand against mass murder and ethnic cleansing, would take a stand for peace, justice, and freedom. I ask that you stand up for what is right. To say Santa Rosa calls for a ceasefire in Gaza is not complicated. To say Santa Rosa stands against genocide is not complicated. 
To say Santa Rosa stands against anti-Semitism and Islamophobia is not complicated. I ask you to do what is right, not what any powerful lobby or corporate entity or political machine or foreign government tells you to do, but to do what you, what you must know in your hearts is right. To say we are against this mass killing of tens of thousands of innocent children, women, and men. We are against the forced starvation of hundreds of thousands of civilians. We want the hostages returned and we want the political prisoners returned. We want peace for Palestine and Israel. Saying we demand a ceasefire is the minimal and the most uncomplicated thing you could do. You represent, represent this city and this country. Call out this U.S. funded genocide, please. Let us not be seen as complicit. Never again for anyone. Let us stand in, on the right side of history. It is not, it is divisive to not call for a ceasefire. It is not anti-Semitic to criticize Israel. It is just to say free Palestine. Must we all become Aaron Bushnell to be heard? Thank you for your time. Thank you. The next speaker will be Dwayne, followed by Elizabeth, then Susan. I'd like to use the overhead, please. Coming up. Hello, my name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland. Earlier I showed you a publication from 32 years ago about cooling communities. And this is a page from it that talked about urban heat islands and the greenhouse effect 32 years ago. Then President Bush, he put together an effort for planting a billion trees is what he wanted to do here in the United States to try to counteract this greenhouse gas effect. So I bring this back to you today because his effort was called America the Beautiful Urban and Community Forestry Assistance Program. Earlier you proclaimed Arbor Week. And I think you should have someone from the city staff reach out to the National Tree Trust and work to get more trees for us here in the Santa Rosa Plain area. Lots of development is going on and they're cutting trees down. They're not replacing them in a timely manner either. One of the dilemmas about all of this is that <clears throat> what's happening is the urban trees that have been cut down, like right over here at Courthouse Square, those grew there for 40 to 50 years. It's gonna take that long to replace them and their benefits for carbon sequestration. Many of these young people that are here now, they wanna make sure that they have a better environment in the future. So we need to have some sort of effort on the part of our city officials to reach out to get these benefits from the federal government and the National Tree Trust. You could do it. It's not going to take that much effort. And if you need volunteers, there are those of us in Roseland who would put together the time and effort to try to get more trees. With that in mind, we're also doing an Earth Day event on April 20th, which is a Saturday. And we invite you all out there at 10 in the morning. Thank you. The next speaker will be Elizabeth, followed by Susan, then Enhui. Is my microphone? Yeah, there it is. I have to get closer. Okay. Um, it has been nearly 75 years that I've lived in this country. In third grade, I lived and went to elementary school in Toronto, Canada. Both my parents grew up in Ontario. Living in a supremacist country eventually has an extremely boring element to it. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's the way I'm starting it. Uh, I've carried many supremacist sock signs for about 10 years. The guns pro proliferate, the wars are grotesque and bizarre. The current genocide in Gaza is a direct and obvious consequence of endless war and endless money for more and more weapons. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Susan, followed by Inhui, and then Shivas. Susan Lamont, District 2. I recently saw the movie Origin about Isabel Wilkerson's journey writing her book, Cast. The book and movie draw the similarities between enslaving black people in the United States, the exploitation of untouchables in India, and the genocide of Jews during the Holocaust in Germany. All use the dehumanization of a group of people for the purposes of exploiting them and killing them. 
it is no surprise that Israeli officials have called Palestinians cockroaches and lice. All the scenes of these murderous policies are gut-wrenching, but the ones most relevant to today are those of the Holocaust. I could not help but think, how can people to whom this happened do this to others? There's a scene in the concentration camp in which a German soldier shoots a mother in the head for trying to protect her daughter. Now picture desperate Palestinians being shot while trying to get food for their starving children. I know a teacher in California, Jewish school, born and raised in Israel. She does not know about the Nakba. Jews have a name for their catastrophe, the Holocaust, but in Israel it is illegal to teach about the Palestinian catastrophe or say its name, the Nakba. My sister is taught in three Jewish schools. She says, if you were a student, you wouldn't even know that Palestinians exist. She says the history of the state of Israel is as slanted and as inaccurate as the teaching of slavery in Ron DeSantis, Florida. Over the top propaganda is the order of the day. We hear some speakers repeat totally debunked Israeli lies. Once we might have forgiven them their ignorance, but it's no longer that excuse. Now it is, as it is in far right Florida, a self-imposed ignorance and it is deadly. Only you can look inside yourselves to determine whether you are also acting, or I should say not acting, out of deadly ignorance. Remember the silence of our representatives during the Holocaust. If you want to know what you would have done during the Holocaust, you're doing it right now. Ceasefire now. Thank you. The next speaker will be In Hui, followed by Shivas, then Diane. Please go ahead. Ceasefire 100 years ago, 75 years ago, now and forever. Today, my city council member lost my vote. My name is Inhi Lee. Greetings from very terribly sad, angry grandmother of two. Because I think of Palestine. I think of Palestine, a collective poem I recite. I wake up thirsty and hungry. I think of Palestine. I go to the doctor's office. I think of Palestine. No bombs, no snipers no dead baby graves in the parking lot. I think of Palestine, I think of Palestine, I think of Palestine. When I see a rainbow, I imagine rainbow over bombshell clouds in Palestine. I think of Palestine when I see children flying kites without worrying about bombs falling over their heads. I think of Palestine when I enter this city hall, the building standing, not in ruins. I think of Palestine when I see and hear people like in Santa Rosa City Council sitting on tax dollar payroll in silence, and therefore complicit in Palestinian genocide by Nazi Israel. I think of a Palestine. She's a fire now and forever. Thank you. The next speaker will be Shivas, followed by Diane, then Gary. Shivas, we'll circle back. Diane, Gary, then Matt. Is this on? Oh, it is. Great. So, hi. My name is Diane, and I live in Santa Rosa. And I'm here to implore you to pass a ceasefire resolution. I ask this as a Jewish person whose grandparents were fortunate to escape Europe with my mother on the eve of the Holocaust, while all but one of my extended family left behind perished. My mother and my grandparents escaped because some people literally risked their lives to get them out, while at the same time others turned away and claimed they didn't know that anything was going on. It is said in the Jewish religion that to save one life 
is to save the entire world. Right now, people are starving in Gaza, dying from Israeli bullets and bombs. Over 300,000 people have died. Children have died of starvation. Right now, there are things we can do to save lives. One of them is to call for a ceasefire. One does not need to know everything about the situation to know that something is terribly wrong. All one needs is a heart, compassion, and a bit of courage. Calling for a ceasefire is actually a mainstream opinion. Please call for a ceasefire now. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Shivas, followed by Gary, then Matt. Shivas, then Gary, then Matt. Okay, we'll circle back to Shivas again. Gary, please step to the podium and go ahead. I'm Gary Huntsman. Uh, I live in Santa Rosa. And uh, I've been troubled by the oppression of the people of Palestine for so many years. And uh, it's just incredible that the savagery is going on now. And it continues at our tax dollars. And I, I, I think it's past time for a change. Uh, Perhaps Aaron Bushnell did in action what we have been a, a, unable to do in words. We've all been speaking and asking for help for these poor people. I've gotten to know some of them. They're very gentle, humble, generous, very, very nice people. We could try to model after them a lot of us Americans. Has Aaron Bushnell opened our eyes and reminded us of our shared humanity and of our responsibility to each other? If he did this for us, may we make a decision at this moment to call for a ceasefire and work for peace. He will live on in us and we will be better people for it. Thank you. The next. So, Madam City Clerk, if I could just jump in. Folks, if you wouldn't mind lining up at both podiums so that we can be as efficient as possible with time between comments. So you, you, you can speak from both podiums. Thank you. The next public comment will be Matt, followed by Jandon, then Thomas. Matt, go ahead. Hello. Yeah. Uh, council members, if you could look up from your computers right now, please. Council members. You asked for public comments, people from the public come here to be heard. And so look, seeing you guys look down, fumble through your notes as people are asking to be heard for you guys to make a statement that is so easy. Cease fire, stop the violence. And if you don't know, turn on your computers, look on your phone. Maybe that's what you should be looking at right now. Look at your phone and look at footage of Palestine and find out why we are here asking you to make a statement. You are our voice. You serve no function to us unless you're going to speak for us. And we are asking you to listen to us and say something for us. And that is stop the killing. And if you can't do that, you have to live with your conscience because that is the statement that was made earlier. What would you do during the Holocaust? You are doing it. And your silence is simply unacceptable. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will. Thank you. Uh, through the vice mayor, I would like to make the announcement about the silent support. Please. Um, to maintain an orderly meeting and respect the opportunity for those wishing to speak after each commenter, we ask that rather than cheering and hand clapping, that the show of support you use is a silent applause. 
And if you can please, um, this is the silent applause gesture. Um, we would appreciate it again to maintain an orderly meeting and respect the opportunities of those speaking after you. The next speakers will be Jandon, followed by Thomas, then Jason. Hello. Go okay, ahead. They spelled my name wrong, so but I'm letting Maria speak in my turn, and we're swapping. Thanks. My name is Maria Barakat. I'm a Lebanese American with family from Palestine. My great aunt Renee was expelled during the Nakba and lived in UN refugee camps in Lebanon with her family for years, making falafel for them because they only had lentils to live on. My dad still talks about the taste of her falafel. Since the last time I was here, before this body, almost 2,000 people have been killed, murdered with US bombs and bullets. Since I saw you last, there has been a flower massacre. Over 100 people were killed and 700 wounded trying to get food, desperate and hungry with US bombs and bullets. A woman who tried to have children for 10 years, lost her twins and husband in a bombing. I'm about to file my taxes and send my hard-earned money to Israel to kill my own people. This body remains painfully and shamefully silent. You cannot stand for peace and justice, but remain silent in times like these. To be silent is to uphold the system of violence. Why are we here week after week? We love justice. When we call for an end to the killing, we mean on all sides the release of all hostages. We mean justice. <sighs> we are not anti-Semitic. We care about all of the other U.S.-generated imperial atrocities occurring today in Yemen, in Lebanon, in Sudan, in Haiti, in DRC, and more. We, in fact, stand before this body and any body who will hear us to denounce all forms of white supremacy and imperial colonial violence. We do not discriminate. U.S. support for the Israeli atrocities happening today is unprecedented. The volume and speed of this genocide in Palestine, a genocide by definition, has rallied us to halt this violence. Palestine needs us now. The number of children killed in the first three months of this genocide surpassed the number killed in Syria in 11 years. That is why we are here now. Do something. Thank you. The next speaker will be Thomas, followed by Jason. Thomas, please go ahead. Thank you. Can you hear me? Thank you. Uh, one thing I want to do is go back to the uh, glyphosate issue. Germany studied glyphosate and found it up to 10 miles from where it was applied. So you really need to work with the county and Caltrans. Um, please follow the International Court of Justice. They are having hearings. They had hearings. You can see them on YouTube. You can see South Africa and Namibia give the arguments uh, in, before the court. Um, it's very important. They previously ordered Israel to prevent civilian or to uh, prevent civilian deaths as much as possible, create protection for them, and to prevent genocide. That's an order that came out of the court already. The flower event demonstrates that Israel did not follow this order. They actually structured the, the way the trucks would arrive with the food aid in order to be opposite the civilians with the trucks in between. And that would be where the civilians would be running towards the food. They could have a plausible deniability about how they fired the weapons. 90% of the victims were hit in the head and the torso. President Biden has written an executive order requiring proof of following UN rules and international law. He's just written this as of last week. They pre just previously, maybe a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, um, they have to provide proof Israel has to provide proof within 45 days that they are following the orders of the UN. They have not followed that. Now, how we are going to resolve that is going to depend on you. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Jason Sweeney. Hi, my name is Jason Sweeney. I'm a resident of Santa Rosa, California. I'm here again to speak to you about the need for a ceasefire resolution. 
We are trying to build critical mass around the radical notion that violence begets violence, and that is why we want to use our collective words to end the harm being done and end the cycle of violence itself. For those of you who are still confused about this five months in, um, this is a quote from Chris Hedges, who is an author, uh, journalist, well, journalist, author, commentator, and Presbyterian minister, uh, if you haven't heard of him recent statement in me made in January genocide is not a political problem it is a moral one it is the crime of all crimes the purest expression of evil another quote in the same talk a politics of hatred creates a permanent instability one that is exploited by those seeking the destruction of civil society what he's saying there is what we're saying which is basically we need to unite around these ideas that we can we can stand together and, and end and draw the line, essentially. I want to call out um, a quote from a movie called A Roadmap to Apartheid. And in this scene, they show a document from the, from the Israeli Ministry of the Planning Department where, they, where the, the government calls for the maintenance of an ethnic balance, 70-30 Jewish to Arab. And if those that policy would not stand here in the U.S. That if we were if we were if we were saying that we had to limit an ethnicity to only 30 percent of the population. So why is it not okay here, but okay in Israel? Um, I just want to say that we are here because of the Zionist project. We have no choice but to bring these issues, the truth forward, and tell these stories um, of the innocent people that have been killed. And it's the only choice that we have. Uh, and these are the natural consequences. Thank you, Vice Mayor. That is 12 public comments on item 14, non-agenda matters. Wonderful. Again, we'll have a, a second round of public comment or public comment on non-agenda matters um, following our next item. Uh, but now we'll move on to item 16.1, our public hearing. Madam City, Madam City Manager. Thank you. Item 16.1 is a public hearing. Development related cost of service fees update. Good evening, Vice, Vice Mayor, members of the Council, Gabe Osborne, Director of Planning and Economic Development. Um, as mentioned in the introduction, the item before the Council at this point in time is a development services fee update. Um, and this is really the next step in uh, the process to adopt the fees, and it really is our final step. We presented this item to the Council in a study session on January 30th. And at that point, the focus of the conversation was on a study that analyzed the full cost associated with providing development services. Um, MGT Consulting Group has performed that study and joining me today is Cindy Sconce who will also be participating in the presentation. Um, before we go into the background, I'd, I'd just like to provide a reminder to the council and members of the public that the fees involved in the study today are service fees. So those fees go into the time that it takes our staff to develop, or excuse me, implement services for development services. Those are typical uh, plan review, inspection services that go into the processing of private development applications. Uh, this action is not infecting any impact fees in the city of Santa Rosa. Um, as far as the fee background goes, in, in 2004, the City Council shifted the methodology associated with fees when service fees, excuse me, when uh, financial strategies were adopted that attempted to achieve 100% cost recovery on development services fees. Prior to that point, fees were heavily subsidized by the general fund. Um, our most recent study was conducted for an overhaul of our fees in 2013. Uh, that resulted in fees being adopted in 2014. That affected our building and planning fees. We also adjusted a small number of our engineering and planning fees in 2017. I would like to point out that the fee study is a longer process um, than um, many of the things that we do. It can go over multiple years. So when we start this process and, and much of the data that is involved in the study was based on fiscal year 22-23 and fees that existed a year and a half ago. Um, as part of the, uh, the study, we do uh, quite a bit of um, 
um, outreach to our stakeholder groups. Uh, typically that involves residents that pull permits. Um, it's, it's heavily involved in the development community that use our services quite often. We produced a survey in August, August and October of 2022 that involved 16 questions that were regarding restructuring options. So was, that survey was launched in both English and Spanish. We received 301 responses to that. In May of 23, we also held a stakeholder meeting with the North Coast Builders Exchange. In November of 20. We held another meeting at the North Coast Builders Exchange, specifically with their board members. In January of 24, we held a general community meeting. And on, as I mentioned earlier on in the presentation, in January 30th, uh, we held the council study session. As far as the comments received, they, they fell into a few different categories and we tried to incorporate all comments received into what you're seeing today. Um, one of the main threads was that fees need to be easy to understand. Um, that came through with members of the community and the development community. Um, and that isn't necessarily that you need more or less fees, it just needs, means that they, it needs to be easy to navigate from a fee schedule standpoint. So one, people can understand up front what the fees are and it's a predictable process. Um, we also heard that fees should be based on efficient processes. Uh, what you'll hear today is the fees are calculated on the average amount of time that it takes to perform a specific service. Uh, so instead of having that be based on an actual service, there was, there was concern that we're actually putting those staff hours to something that's not efficient. So what we did to address that is the averages that you'll see today are based on an efficient process and not necessarily the hours that are being performed today. It's when we actually can modify those programs and move forward in an efficient way. It's based on that. Um, we also heard an understanding, um, excuse me, on that point too, uh, another piece that I think is incredibly important to this. Um, many jurisdictions, as you'll see as part of this presentation, are moving towards 100% cost recovery through an invoicing process. So essentially, applicants pay as they go and they pay for the actual time. Um, the development community had some significant concerns about that based on the fact that that does not breed efficiency, so we've removed that from the process moving forward. Um, we also heard from the development community that there is an understanding that costs are raising. Uh, we haven't adjusted the fees in 10 years, um, and many of the, the developers have seen costs raise on their side and understand that there is a need to raise the fees. Uh, there was also a willingness to pay more for reduced turnaround times. Uh, so there is an understanding that the fees go into services provided and developers benefit from those services. And the more resources that are in place to provide those services, the quicker development applications move through the system. Um, we also had concerns about fee increases applying to projects that are currently in the queue. Uh, we have a slide dedicated later in the presentation to talk specifically about that. Um, we also heard that these fees, uh, the service fees, are a very small percentage of the overall project cost. In many situations for larger projects, they're one to two percent. On smaller projects, they're much less than that. Uh, this chart was shown during the study session, but I, I think it's very important um, because it's, we have to understand the relationship between permit volumes, revenue, and expenditures. Uh, so what we see on this chart, the bars actually show the number of permits that we received from 2015 to today annually. Uh, those permits are shown blue in building, uh, yellow in engineering, and green in planning. They do not include any activity for the fire rebuild, so this is really our core services. Uh, the red line shows our expenditures and the black line shows our revenue. Um, and what we wanted to do in this particular case is really show the true costs associated with development services. So we excluded costs associated with our economic development division and our code enforcement division. Um, and typically what we see on this chart is we see over time that permits will increase and decrease and typically the expenditures will grow as permits increase and that's really the response to the immediate need of processing permits. And we attempt to really achieve a certain percentage of cost recovery in that process. And we would never achieve 100% because development services is much more than just processing applications. We provide customer service. We're there for the community in many ways. So we typically try to focus on a cost recovery in the 70 to 75% range. Um, very difficult to achieve year to year, but that typically is the goal. And what we've seen with our structure that we currently have over the last year, as applications start to slow our revenue 
revenue starts to slow and the gap between our revenue and our expenditures widens. So really as we increase fees, we're trying to close that gap. And that's very important to providing services to the community because in the absence of increasing that revenue, as permits reduce or our revenue slightly reduces, then generally our expenditures will reduce. And that strips resources to the permitting process. So our goal today is to try to achieve that 70% cost recovery and to bring those lines closer together. Um, in the next slides, we'll talk about the project objectives and the methodology used in the study. And at this point, I will hand the presentation over to Cindy. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, one of our primary objectives, as Gabe mentioned, was to simplify or make the fee schedule much easier for your consumers to follow and understand what their fee would actually be. So we did some significant restructuring just to simplify those fees, uh, making them a lot easier for everybody to understand. Uh, we also wanted to define what it truly cost the city to provide those services. So we looked at, okay, so what does it take to process that permit? What does it actually cost? Uh, we determined whether there are any services where a fee could be collected. There's been a lot of changes recently, so we identified if there were services that needed to be added to the fee schedule that uh, the city would be providing. And then identify service areas where the city might adjust fees based on either full cost of service or other economic or policy uh, considerations, as Gabe mentioned. Our methodology was really based on transparency. We built a fully burdened hourly rate and uh, we took that average time to provide that service. As Gabe mentioned, we took into account uh, the efficiency factor. You may be spending a little bit more time right now, but the goal is to be as efficient as possible and that is how we costed those services out. Um, product of the hourly rate times the time is basically what it is costing to provide those services. There's a very clear nexus between the cost of that service uh, by doing that. None of the recommendations uh, that we are making are taxes. They are all in alignment with Prop 26, which means you cannot uh, make a profit on those services or those fees that you collect. This is a snapshot of uh, your current revenues versus what it's actually costing to provide those services. Now some of this, such as building being slightly over, that is purely volume. It is not uh, due to fees being excessive. We were coming out of the peak uh, activity for building. So basically we were taking in a lot of, of permits at the time um, and uh, so we see a slight overage there. The overall cost recovery you can see was about 77%. Uh, some areas were lower, some areas higher. Uh, again, this is full cost recovery, and this is not the target that Gabe had mentioned earlier, uh, which he's going to discuss uh, a little later in this presentation. So there is a gap right now. Uh, you're currently recurring about 77% overall. Uh, some of the fees need to be lowered, some of the fees need to be raised to uh, come back into alignment. Thank you, Cindy. Um, and then a summary of what we're proposing today. Um, obviously, the, the fee study is a fairly large document. There are quite a few fees that are addressed in that study. It's a very holistic approach to pretty much all of the building engineering planning uh, fees that we have. Uh, so I'll do my best to provide a summary of those. Um, generally, what we're seeing is the importance to set at a full cost recovery. So that's really what we're proposing tonight, is that all fees be set at a baseline full cost recovery moving forward. Um, and generally, what we've seen with the fees is there's been an increase in operational costs over time. And we have had certain fees in the department that have natural annual escalators based on the consumer price index where they just go up every year, but that's a very small number of fees. And what we found is even in those situations with the 3% increases that generally happen through that process is they're not necessarily keeping up with the general overall increase in costs. 
So we've also seen additional cross support hours come into our fees. So this is actually including hours that are applied to a permit process from other departments. Uh, Transportation, Public Works, Fire are very active in our permit review process and this is capturing those hours. Um, so that's driving the cost up a bit. We've also seen additional state requirements that are increasing staff hours. So there's been quite a bit of housing legislation that's come down over the years. That's creating unique processes, increasing our review time, and that ultimately is increasing cost. Uh, we've, we've had a big shift into the digital arena due to COVID. We went from a paper process to 100% a virtual and digital process, and we found that that does have a technology cost to it. We're seeing more software companies going to subscription services and more software packages being involved in the review process. So we've seen an increase of cost on that front. Um, we're also seeing from our advanced planning standpoint, that's a very heavy consultant-driven exercise. Our internal staff control that, but we have a lot of those wrenching hours being performed by consultants and we've seen significant costs in that area as well. So overall, that is triggering the majority of the fees to increase. Um, what we're also proposing is some modifications to our existing fee classifications. Uh, we are adding some new fees to cover time that is not currently recovered. Um, the example I provided of transportation and public works supporting processes, uh, they actually have their operations team, for example, in a new subdivision where new streetlights are involved. Um, that team activates those streetlights and that's a cost that's not covered. So we've added certain light items to, to recover those costs. Um, we've also seen, as I mentioned, state housing legislation through SB9 and SB35. Those are distinctly different processes. And as we've gone through that, we now have fees that cover those. Um, we've also expanded a single fee into multiple categories. And this is usually for clarity's sake. Uh, for example, a fee could be based on construction costs, which is very difficult for a property owner to understand and calculate. So instead of doing that, we would have a line item of various costs that would go into that total. Um, and that might be for doing public um, improvement uh, work Work that a property owner can understand exactly what it takes to replace a sidewalk square and a driveway approach as well as a combination of those two. Um, and we're also seeing certain fees decrease through this process. And that is really a result of efficiencies that we've put in over the years. As we analyze those hours, the hours, although the cost for the service and the hours has increased, the number of hours have dropped down to those efficiencies. So this, these project examples were presented during the study session, but we'll go over those very quickly because they highlight some of the changes. So the first example is a residential subdivision project, a larger one of 100 lots or greater. Uh, these are individual building permits for all of those 100 lots. Um, so what we've seen in this particular case is the building fee has increased uh, per lot. We have seen increases on the planning side, but we have seen a significant decrease with the new fee proposal on the engineering side. So that has resulted in a net reduction in the overall fee for that project. Our next example is a large multifamily project. Uh, this could be market rate or affordable. Uh, we've seen a lot of those come through over the last five years. Um, it's very similar situations. We've seen a significant jump on the building side and we'll talk specifically about this building permit application in a future slide when we look at our comparison analysis. Um, regionally, we are very low in this area. Um, we have seen a jump in the planning side as well. Uh, that is a lot of those cross support hours coming into the equation. And we've also seen the reduction on the engineering side, but in this particular case, that reduction does not offset the increases on planning and building. Um, we also have an example of a standalone accessory dwelling unit. That's a fairly common form of development. Um, very slight reduction on the building side, uh, but we do see an increase on the engineering side. Uh, typically with um, accessory dwelling units, it may be sidewalk replacement, it may be a driveway approach replacement or not. And that's an important piece. They don't always have an engineering element so that if that's added on because we're seeing increases on those minor encroachment permits, it would increase the cost. We also analyzed a commercial tenant improvement of 5,000 square feet. Um, we're seeing a reduction on the building side. We're seeing an increase on the planning side, once again, because of those cross support hours. And we're seeing an increase on the engineering side as well. Um, very important to note that in this particular case as well, it may not be all three. This is really represents a worst case scenario for a commercial tenant improvement. 
So now this leads us to what we've been working on since the uh, study session. So um, much of the conversation in the study session was to, to give an overview of the fee study, but also to talk about areas where the council may want to see a reduction in the fees. So any reduction in the fee does increase the department's general fund burden. So those are our two main revenue sources, fees or general fund, and then they balance out year to year to, based on the amount of revenue that we get in through fees. So one of the fees that we have always historically subsidized have been permits that support health life safety. And sometimes when fees increase to the point where they cannot be digestible by the community, we run into an avoidance situation where the permit's not pulled, it triggers more code enforcement action. Um, we typically want to encourage those permits that provide safety to the structure. And those are typically what we refer to as trade permits. They're mechanical, plumbing, and electrical. Uh, that goes into heating systems, electrical panels. We want to encourage people to pull those permits. So we're proposing a 25% reduction in that permit fee. What that 25% will do it will take the fee down to very close to where it currently exists with a slight reduction. So that's generally going to be flat moving forward with that reduction. Um, we are also proposing a reduction of encroachment permits that replace residential sidewalks. Uh, so this would typically encourage, because residential sidewalks are a property owner's responsibility, would encourage that individual to go through the process to fix uplifted sections to restore that sidewalk um, for a safe path of travel. So we're proposing a 50% reduction on that. Uh, we're also proposing a reduction on our planning appeal fees, uh, which have historically always been reduced dramatically. Um, we've almost always seen a reduction to the tune of 90 to 95% on the, the appeal fees and these are very specific to the neighbor or non-applicant appeal. Um, so this would be somebody appealing a project, not necessarily an applicant that's appealing a denial of a project. That's a different appeal process. So the council also expressed an interest to see development specific reductions. Um, so we did our best to put those into a few different categories. Um, the first is grocery. Um, so we're defining grocery as defined in the chapter 20 of the city code. So that includes both large and small, um, from a community market all to a full-blown grocery store. And we're looking at specific areas. So a grocery in the downtown station area or a defined food desert. So the food desert is defined by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and it focuses really on two pieces. It focuses on poverty rate and the distance people are within existing grocery stores. Um, so the important piece with that calculation is, is there is a map, and it's very easy for, for us to follow that and to ensure that the property is either inside or outside that boundary. And what we're proposing is a 50% reduction on all associated building planning and engineering fees. So that's any fee that the department applies to that project will be applied at a full cost and reduced immediately by 50% for that reduction. Um, we're also proposing something similar for daycare facilities. So we wanted to make this fairly wide, so we're taking our full definition of daycare as defined in City Code Section Chapter 20. Um, and this includes child daycare facilities, which is your major standalone facility, but it also includes the in-home child care, both large, small, and it includes adult daycare. So that's an entire category in our zoning code of daycare facilities. And once again, we're looking at a reduction of 50% across the board on all permit types. We're also proposing a reduction on market rate housing within the downtown station area. And I think this is important to really show the support that we've all shown for development in the downtown over the years to encourage the market rate development. And we're really focusing on housing units that are four units or greater. So th those are your larger um, housing projects. Wouldn't necessarily include an ADU or a smaller single unit on the lot. These are the bigger projects. And we're focusing, uh, once again, on the 50% reduction across the board on all fees. But in this particular case, we're applying that to building and engineering. And there's a very specific purpose for that. Um, we've actually made changes to the way in which um, projects are processed in the downtown station area through reduced review authority. Where a project may have been elevated to the Planning Commission, it no, now goes down to the Zoning Administrator um, with very simple um, concept design review. So we changed process, and that process reduced the fee. So we neck that down. So they already really reap the benefits of that, and that fee is fairly low. Um, so with that, we're tackling the bigger increases which are happening really on the building and engineering side. So we also want to extend that same allowance and that same reduction to affordable housing projects. Um, it is very difficult to define affordable housing projects. That means a lot of things to a lot of different people. Um, we work very closely with our housing department to figure out a definition for where we would apply a 50% reduction. And really this would be 100% affordable projects with an affordability level of 60% or less of AMI. That would ex exclude the on-site management units. So those are allowed to fall under a different category. 
inventory, and it must be with a housing agreement with the city. And this would be citywide. It wouldn't be restricted to any geographic area within our boundary. And they would receive a 50% reduction on all associated building and engineering specific fees. Um, in this particular case, what we will be proposing moving forward to the council when we get into our resilient city development measures, it was we will be proposing to extend the same right from a reduced review authority to the same housing category as we have for the downtown. Um, so that will give them the streamlined approach. The fee will come down with that, um, and that package will be brought to the, the, plan, uh, the, excuse me, the Planning Commission first, but then also the City Council prior to the end of the fiscal year. So when we look at the impacts of those reductions, um, it's always difficult to understand what it'll look like because we don't always know the number of projects that will come through in a year. Um, so in this particular case, um, what MGT has analyzed is an average number of permits, and then we looked at that average number of permits to try to better understand what type of subsidized or reduced permits would be in that total to understand the impacts that the reductions would have. So what we see on the trade permits is generally that's a small reduction, about $55 per permit but it's across a high number of permits. Uh, typically trade permits are, are our highest volume building permit. Uh, anywhere from 4,000 to 5,000 a year is what we end up with. Um, so overall that reduction is anticipated to be almost 250,000 um, when we achieve those volumes. Um, when we get into the larger projects, um, and, and daycare is all-encompassing. So if we looked at a standalone daycare facility that is a new build from the ground up, that's very similar to a multifamily project that's in the same category. Um, that actually has a more significant reduction because of the fees are higher. Uh, so we looked at that category and assumed that if we had five of those larger projects moving forward in a year, the reduction per project would be about 120000 So that would result in about a $600,000 reduction. Um, in most years, we don't experience that. So this really is, is very aggressive with the estimates on uh, what the impacts will be, and I truly do, do believe represents worst case scenario. Um, when we looked at the encroachment permit and the appeal fields, they were very small. We don't get a lot of those permits, so we've added in $50,000 um, impact in that reduction. So really what we're looking at is um, around 900000 for what the financial impact would be to those reductions. I think that's an important point um, to the whole conversation. Uh, Cindy mentioned that overall, if we adopt this fee schedule, we're looking at an increase in our revenue under those specific permit volumes to the tune of 23%. So if we add these reductions into that, that moves us down into closer to 20%. So we're still looking at an increase in the fee. It's 3% less. Now, I think if we look out year to year when we aren't really able to project the total amount of permits that we see, um, what we've analyzed is that generally year to year, the reductions will have between 17 to 20%. We'll still be basically seeing that level of increase in revenue. So if we analyze the same permit total under our current fee schedule and our new fee schedule, under most years that new fee schedule is going to achieve 17 to 20% increase in revenue. So we, we discussed in the study session um, the comparison with other agencies too, that's part of this process, and I'll go through these fairly quickly because we did review them as part of the study session. Um, anytime we do a comparison with other agencies, it's really important to note when the agency did their fees. Um, the comparison surveys don't really dig far into the fee itself because it's what is published on the, the jurisdiction, and we can't always understand what their true costs are. So do salary and benefits match up to what salary and benefits are into the city of Santa Rosa? Um, but the main catalyst, and these are the, the development types that are always compared through these studies, are the development of single-family dwellings and the building fee, and the development of multifamily units and the building fee. So what we've seen, the plan check and inspection fee in Santa Rosa is around $4,845 under the current fee schedule. We are slightly reducing that with the proposal. Um, and then what we're seeing from multifamily, that's where we're seeing the big jump is where it's going from 29,000 to 54,000. Um, but when we compare that to the other agencies um, on the single family side, you, you, we can see that we're, we're very close to the median, actually under the median and under the average. So we're still very competitive regionally. And even with the increase on the multifamily, we're still very competitive regionally, um, being either at the median and under the average. Um, when we look at the planning side, and, and this just points out a few pieces um, with planning and some of the trends that we're seeing with other jurisdictions. Uh, SB 35 um, came out of state housing legislation and really required a ministerial process on something that was discretionary. Um, we applied a fee that we thought would cover the staff time, and when we did the analysis, it did not. 
So the current fee is around uh, $4,000, $3,569 for an SB9 application. When we truly proof that out as part of the study, it jumped the fee up to 23216 I think it is important to note that a lot of the projects that go through SB35 potentially would also be eligible for the reductions if approved. Um, with the minor uh, projects, we haven't seen the same fluctuation, and actually on our subdivision maps, we've seen a reduction in our fee, it re reduced down on the planning side. Um, the important piece that we're seeing here is as many of the trends, especially as we see the development cycle start slowing down a little bit, um, many of the jurisdictions are moving towards a full cost recovery, and that, that methodology typically involves a deposit and then billing until that deposit is drawn down and then collecting another deposit. We are not proposing that, um, but it's difficult to compare when that's actually used for other jurisdictions. So the, the last slide deals with the effective date. Um, at, at this point, we are proposing that the fees go into effect on July 1st. Uh, that will give our staff time, our staff time to actually incorporate the fees into our permitting system. And the applicability of these fees, typically what happens when fees increase, we do not apply those to projects that are currently under review. So if a project comes in prior to the fee increase, it locks into that previous fee schedule. And that's what we're proposing to do today. Um, the interesting anomalies occur when the fees actually reduce because then there's more of an incentive for a developer moving forward to take advantage of both fee schedules, and we will allow that. Um, so a project pays fees at certain points throughout the process. So when the fee payment is due, we will allow the developer, if it's after July 1, to either pay based on the old fee schedule if it's less or the new fee schedule. Um, the important point is we don't make the fees retroactive, so we don't provide refunds for fees paid prior to July 1 if the fees do go down. So that brings us to the conclusion of the presentation, and I'd like to just briefly go over the recommendations. We are recommending that the council adopt fees based on the fee studies, Appendix A. Um, we are also recommending that, that the council adopt the development uh, reduct fee reductions that are proposed in the Exhibit B. Um, and another important point, which um, also came out in the study session, is we're um, recommending that the council grant authority to the director to update the fees annually based on the CPI. Um, that's an important piece to keeping the fees up to date with time. And with that, we're happy to answer any questions that the council may have. Thank you both. I'm looking to council for questions. All right, I'm gonna ask one just to just to break the trend here. Um, I'm doing some, some back of the envelope math. If the total cost recovery last year was around 10.9 million, and we're gonna be able to in, increase the cost recovery by 17 to 20%, are we, so we're looking at somewhere in that $2 million range for additional revenue each year? That's correct. Um, one, one of the important pieces to that is the total volume of permits coming in. So when our study was performed, it was performed on a fairly high volume of permits. We, we've seen some of the highest permits that the department has ever seen over the last five years. So really the relationship of the increase is, is based on the total amount of permits, and if those permits reduce, our revenue will reduce along with that. So if our permits stay, then absolutely yes. Then if they fall within those five-year totals, then we're assuming around 2.4 is what we would anticipate million in additional revenue if those permit volumes hold. The only unknown is what they will look like the next fiscal and calendar year. The Understood. Thank you. Uh, and with that, we'll go to public comment. Madam City Clerk. Thank you. We are now taking public comment on item 16.1. If you are in the chamber and would like to comment but have not yet provided a speaker card or your name, please make your way to the podium. You will have two minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that podium. I'd like to call the first speaker, Callum. Good evening, uh, Callum Wings, I'm the policy director for Generation Housing and a Santa Rosa resident. Uh, so we're in full support of the, the staff recommendations for you tonight. You know, as we stated during the last city session on this item, we understand human capital is really the greatest asset of any organization. And we want to ensure that the staff bringing pro-housing policy to life are, are fully resourced. It's also incredibly exciting uh, to see the city advance fee reductions that can help further creation of essential services like childcare, grocery stores, things that we all know we need desperately in this community, especially in the downtown area. And it's also really incredibly exciting to, to see you guys taking uh, strong action uh, to support uh, desperately needed affordable housing as well. These are really the bold solutions that will move Santa Rosa forward 
and, and bring renewed vibrancy to this community. So thank you uh, so much for your work on this. We look forward to that other fee discussion uh, coming before you soon. And uh, I just want to wish you a wonderful evening and uh, make sure you get out and vote. Vice Mayor, uh, a quick correction. I do want to note that the official opening of the public hearing started at 6.03, uh, just for to note in the minutes. Oh, thank you for that correction. And we'll go to the next speaker. Please go ahead, Thomas. Well, thank you for the opportunity to speak. And uh, it looked to me like the cost recovery was about 50% when I looked at that. $8 million in revenue and close to $16 million of expenses. I'm not exactly sure why that was. There was a, quite a diversion there in that last year. Um, we see with SMART that freight does not pay for the maintenance of the way. And so the passengers are subsidizing the freight because they're not pay, they don't pay for it. In, that's a typical situation and SMART is encountering a freight discussion at this time. In the case of the development, if the developer is subsidized by 25 to 50 percent, that subsidy is a general fund tax increase. So there is that effect of the tax increase. And I would recommend to you that you subsequently recover the fee reductions from the developers after the occupancy. So there was a period of time during the, the fires and the recovery that, that fees were reduced, and there was an effort to recover some of that afterwards, or there was a discussion about that, and I would recommend that for you, is that you, you give the developer the opportunity to have a, a current fee reduction, but when they have occupancy, when they're passed and they're in the development stage, they're, they're completed with the development stage, in, in effect, and they're having occupancy that then they reimburse those fee reductions because it's a very significant amount. It doesn't, I mean, you know, it looked like $900,000 there, but where, it wasn't really expressed where the bulk of the fees are obtained then. Where, where do the fees come from if those are the only reductions? Thank you. So are there more public comments on item 16.1? Please go ahead. Hey, thanks again. I'm Roxy again. Um, just for one quick moment. I just uh, appreciate all you're saying, but I'd like, I, I just feel like this, uh, a lot more needs to be done for affordable housing. And like you say, it's a broad category. And, and you said one category is left out of there. I guess that was more supportive housing, maybe management on site. Um, but I, don't know, I see this 50% reduction fees for market rate and 50% a reduction for affordable housing. I feel there needs to be uh, more incentive for affordable housing and that, that's a lot more and less, uh, we don't, less, uh, I know we need the market rate as well, but we need a lot more affordable housing in this county all over. Thank you. Vice Mayor Stepp, I see no one else approaching the podium in chamber for the public hearing on 16.1. Thank you. With that, I think I can officially close public comment, or public, close the public hearing, rather, correct? And turn it back to council for additional comments, final comments. Councilmember Krupke? Yeah, I just want to say thank you so much. This has been a heavy lift for quite some time now, um, and I really appreciate it, especially now that we've seen we were subsidizing basically $3.2 million average over the last three completed fiscal years. That's, that's massive. Um, and as you pointed out, this is... Uh, well, I guess it's, it's illegal for us to, to, to uh, profit off of this, but to make ourselves whole um, on our, our human capital that we have here is, is very important. Um, and then I, I do want to point out that with the reduced review authority, we, it's that double-edged sword of fast government, right? Of everybody wants fat government to move faster when it's something they know about, but when it's something they don't know about, they want it to move slower. Cause, so, um, uh, I think it's important to, to understand um, going through this, what we're trying to accomplish and why the, uh, the authority, the review authority has been reduced is to, is to fast track these things that the council and, and as well as staff and the community have agreed upon are important, such as daycares, groceries and food deserts and those sorts of things. But overall, just uh, thank you so much for the presentation and all the work you put in over the past few years. Any other comments from my colleagues? 
then I'll just second what Council Member Krupke said, um, another thoughtful presentation. I like the emphasis on fee clarity, fee fairness. Uh, there were some there were smart, fee re smart and targeted fee reductions, um, all with an eye to budget. A nice job um, is with the, the revenue projections that you that you included as the as the city continues to watch the bottom line pretty closely. So thank you very much. Uh, and with that, Madam City Clerk, would you please call the vote? Oh, I'm sorry. I need to make a motion here. Um, I believe it was Councilmember Alvarez. Would you put a motion on the table? Thank you, Vice Mayor. I'd like to put forth a resolution of the Council of the City of San Rosa, adopting the full cost development service fees, authorizing the Planning and Economic Development Director to adjust all fees annually based on the Consumer Price Index and adopting certain fee reductions to further city development goals and waive further reading of the text. Second. All right, we have a motion from Councilmember Alvarez and a second from Councilmember, um, um, oh my gosh. McDonald, I'm sorry, it's been a long night. Uh, Madam City Clerk, would you please call the vote? Thank you. Councilmember Rogers is absent. Councilmember Okrepke? Aye. Councilmember McDonald? Aye. Councilmember Fleming? Aye. Councilmember Alvarez? Aye. Vice Mayor Stapp? Aye. And Mayor Rogers is absent. This passes with five affirmative votes with Mayor Rogers and Councilmember Rogers absent. All right, and with that, we'll move on to item 17, written communications, of which there are none. So we'll move on to our final public comment, final public comment on non-agenda matters for the evening, item 18. Madam City Clerk, would you please facilitate public comment? Thank you. We are now taking public comment on item 18, non-agenda matters. If you have previously provided public comment on non-agenda matters, this is not a second opportunity to provide public comment. Uh, if you have not submitted a speaker card or your name, please uh, line up at opposite podiums to provide public comment. You will have two minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. The first speaker will be Tess, followed by Holly, then Tammy. Hello, Santa Rosa City Council. I understand that today you have acknowledged this month to honor the Red Cross. That's so amazing because humanitarian aid and humanitarian workers are some of the most crucial people meeting those who are underserved. And I think right now there is a very large group of people who are being underserved and who need to be met. There are the 1.9 million Palestinians internally displaced within the Gaza Strip, the largest concentration camp in the world. Or further, there are the 5.9 million Palestinians that have been displaced across and around the occupied Palestinian territory through Lebanon, through Jordan, and many who even live here in our community today who are still recognized by the United Nations as refugees. As you make this proclamation to acknowledge March for the Red Cross, it is important that you also make proclamations on behalf of your uh, constituents here in the city of Santa Rosa to pass a ceasefire resolution. We have been in your chambers for months now. Israel has not stopped murdering for months now and we have been asking you in this room and in other rooms wherever we can find you to do something and I understand that some of you may be super uncomfortable with this that this may not be a local issue but it is also important to remember that in 1867 the city of Santa Rosa was taken from the indigenous peoples and given in a land grant by the state of California to settler Maria Carrillo. She was the first settler of our beautiful city and she did on behalf of the state the exact same thing that Israel is doing to the indigenous Palestinians. Israel is American history 250 years later. We have a duty to act. Pass a ceasefire resolution. Thank you. The next speaker will be Tam, or pardon me, Holly, followed by Tammy, then Maria. Sis, can you hear me? Yeah. I don't know how to use this because I have something to show. I'm putting it on now. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So my name is Holly Kalika. I'm a resident of 
of Santa Rosa. I really hadn't planned to speak today. What you see before you are, are cranes that are in the tradition of the Japanese people. I used to be a teacher in San Francisco. I taught for 26 years starting in high school and ending in elementary school. In the, in the early 80s, I taught a young girl named Samia Ayub, and this, this talk is in honor of her. She was the first Palestinian student that I had, and she told me about her life and the Nakba that her family went through. I, I commend our last speaker because it's true. For those of us that are people of color and for those of us that have had our lands taken away, I need to say that the United States of America was founded in violence. As we could see in our own community, there's a lot of violence. Uh, the city council members talked about that earlier. We cannot forget our history. And actually, many of us are from the global majority. And that's why you see the world itself calling for an end to the genocide. So you can decide what you want to do, but the reality is that the lands that we stand on has a lot of blood on it already, and it's time to make repair. It's time to make repair for the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island, including all the California peoples here, for their land back. And I want you to think about that. And it's also time for us to think about reparations for any of the enslaved people as well, and that's going on in California. But it's also time for everyone to know their history. And we're in living history right now. For those of you that ignore what's happening on Instagram, and on TikTok that we see every day. I started folding these because I had high anxiety and I'm a clinical herbalist now. And I work with a lot of people around healing. How do you heal oneself? How can we as a community heal ourselves when we're still not healed from what happened to Andy Lopez? The next speaker will be Tammy followed by Maria then Summer. Half of a non, an anti-Zionist Jew who resides in Santa Rosa. Here we are again, another city council meeting where you have so many voices showing up again to ask you for the same thing that you keep ignoring. More people show up weekly to talk about this issue than any other issue combined and have been for months now, and you keep ignoring these voices. Recently, the Sonoma County Commission on Human Rights passed a ceasefire letter. The town of Fort Bragg, California passed a ceasefire letter. Amherst, Massachusetts, Massachusetts, Athens, Georgia, Durham, North Carolina have all recently passed ceasefire resolutions, and yet you will have not, have not introduced one. This reminds me of how in the 80s and early 90s, most states had adopted Martin Luther King Day as a federal holiday. Arizona, however, dug their heels in. Even though it was made a federal holiday in 1983, Arizona refused to permanently recognize it until almost 10 years later in 1993, and that was under threat of removing the hosting of the Super Bowl. Arizona will rightfully be remembered as being on the wrong side of history for this inaction. The government of Santa Rosa, what is your Super Bowl? What do we have to do in order for you to listen to the will of the people who are consistently showing up and pleading with you for action on this. You've told the press Democrat that the language wasn't neutral enough. We have modified the language twice now. It's at srceasefire.com if you have yet to read it. Are there other hoops that you'd like us to jump through? Or are you just determined to stay on the wrong side of history? Ceasefire now. It's time to do the right thing. Thank you. The next speaker will be Maria, followed by Summer, then Manbi. Me and Maria switched places because they had to go back to work. But um, my name is Jordan. I'm Jewish. Um, I feel like we maybe haven't adequately dispelled some of the BS opposition talking points. So I just wanted to read you guys the Hamas charter um, because that's been a big talking point amongst the opposition, which they have failed to um, 
properly source what they've been referring to, which is from the charter 40 years ago. There's one from 2017, and it um, explicitly states, Hamas affirms that its conflict is with the Zionist project, not with the Jews because of their religion. Hamas does not wage a struggle against the Jews because they are Jewish, but wages a struggle against the Zionists who occupy Palestine. Yet it is the Zionists who constantly identify Judaism and the Jews with their own colonial project and a legal entity. Okay, second point. Um, I did the stats, I sent it to you guys. Uh, of all the archives since we've been coming here since December and since all the email comments through then as well, um, in-person comments, 91.2% have been in favor of, the cease, of a ceasefire resolution, and over email, it's over 83%. So at this point, I'm just wondering um, if you're not willing to stand up against genocide and you're not willing to abide by the democratic process by which you were elected, then what are you doing here? Um, furthermore, if Santa Rosa is too small to make a difference, yet we are the fifth largest economy in the world, California, and Santa Rosa is the largest city north of San Francisco, and you're still not willing to risk your puny Santa Rosa uh, elected official career to stand up against genocide, which is it? Ceasefire now. The next speaker will be Summer, followed by Manby, then Giovanni. Hi, my name is Summer Abdelkhalik. I live in District 5. I am a Palestinian American, and I am here once again to make a comment in support of passing a ceasefire resolution. I think um, I keep hearing that this is not within your jurisdiction or it's not a local issue, but I would like to plead the case that it is. And I think it's really important to send a message from Santa Rosa directly that we believe in peaceful diplomatic solutions. And I believe that this impacts our community and our children and just how the youth are acting in schools, like how many times I open the paper and I hear about a kid bringing a weapon to school. Like, how can we not see the connection between what our federal government is doing and what happens here in Santa Rosa? We have the power to say something and we need to utilize it. Um, and I hope that you will do that, thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Menby, followed by Giovanni, then Jacqueline. Hello, my name is Mari B. Could I have this um, thing on just in case? Certainly. Um, so uh, I'm here again to ask for you to support a ceasefire resolution to be added to the agenda. Um, you're honoring the Red Cross. The Red Cross, their mission statement is to prevent and alleviate human suffering in the face of emergencies by mobilizing the power of volunteers and the generosity of donors. Hence, the power of the people. Hence, we, the people, are here advocating for the Red Cross and their mission statement. It is hypocritical for our city council to honor the Red Cross and refuse to support a ceasefire resolution and refuse to do their part to take a stand for human rights and speak out against the immense human suffering we are witnessing. Another hypocrisy of our city council members who refuse to listen to their constituents, Arbor Day. We care so much about trees, right? Since 1967, more than 800,000 Palestinian olive trees have been illegally uprooted by Israeli authorities and settlers. Many were centuries old, which according to the human rights organizations is a violation of UN humanitarian resolutions. Why should you care? Because your constituents care. Proclamation for Women's History Month, yet none of you seem to care about women in Palestine using tent, tent cloth for sanitary napkins, or when thousands have been murdered, or when Israeli forces pose with their underwear. They've murdered them and they're posing with their underwear. There's hundreds of pictures to see. I have them on my phone, but I wanna keep talking. So why should you care about the women in Gaza? Because your constituents do. 
Lastly, I as a constituent do not assume that my vote or my taxpayer money goes to your personal public opinion. It goes for you to do what your constituents want. And last week, 33 asked for a ceasefire resolution. Oppose, only three. So, your job is to do what we want. If you do not do what we're asking, luckily people get fired. No ceasefire resolution, no vote, November 2024. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Giovanni, followed by Jacqueline, then Sarah. Hello, my name is Giovanni. I was born and raised here in Santa Rosa, District 3. I'm here to show support for a ceasefire resolution. We have been pushing our, for our representatives at, at all levels to push for a ceasefire resolution, and we're asking here locally for your support. I work in the public school system with people who work tirelessly, tirelessly for this community, for this city, who want a ceasefire resolution. It's, even if you don't think um, it is a local issue, we simply ask you to represent us. The majority of voters want a ceasefire resolution. Please add a ceasefire resolution to the agenda. At this point, it is becoming an active effort not to add it. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Jacqueline, followed by Sarah, then Lee. Good evening. I live in the 5th District of Santa Rosa. Thanks for giving me your attention, even though I know we're all tired and probably don't really want to be here right now. I'm sure we all rather be at home. Uh, it's day 150 of the genocide in Gaza, and still not one of you has been able to muster the moral fiber to bring a ceasefire resolution to the agenda. We've brought you a draft that calls for peace for all parties. We've made countless rebuttals against your flaccid arguments that this is not a local issue. And still you've chosen at best blissful ignorance, or at worst, outright malice. Last week I emailed you a copy of a recent letter by the Sonoma County Commission on Human Rights. I brought hard copies in case you haven't read it. I'll leave those with the clerk. Uh, they're calling for an immediate ceasefire and release of all hostages. The commission states, quote, advocating for the protection of non-combatants is a shared responsibility transcending borders. So right now I'm asking you sincerely, what are you doing to shoulder that shared responsibility? What are you doing? You haven't done anything. On day 150 of the genocide, the city of Santa Rosa made a proclamation in honor of the Red Cross and encourage citizens of Santa Rosa to support humanitarian missions of the Red Cross. The International Red Cross has di declared a dire humanitarian crisis in Gaza, where the health system has nearly completely collapsed. There are dire shortages of food, water, fuel, medical supplies. 30,000 people have died. 83% of them are women and children. And now a million plus people are facing the real and grim reality of famine. 16 confirmed cases of children starving to death. I'm going to leave you with these words of a parent who watched their child starve to death. The canned food caused dryness and inflammation on his lips. He'd say, Baba, please get me something to eat. I went to the market. I couldn't find anything, only one pomegranate. He ate that, then his breathing changed. His brother said, Baba, please hurry. He's suffocating. I tried CPR, but it was too late. He died from lack of nutrition. He was like a skeleton. He had no meat on him. We don't know what to do. What do we worry more about? The markets, hygiene clinics, no medicine. He's gone now, and what can I do? What can you do? The next speaker will be Sarah, followed by Lee, then Bailey. Hello, uh, my name is Sarah. I am a Sonoma County resident. I was born and raised in Sonoma County. Um, I'm also Jewish and grew up in the local Jewish community. Um, earlier in the city council meeting, we were asked to stop clapping and to keep decorum by using silent clapping um, in the name of respect. And I want to ask, where is that same respect when half of you are looking down at your computers when we're talking about things like genocide? I saw someone talking about her family surviving the Holocaust, and half of you were looking down during that time. Or when someone was talking about their family being expelled in the Nakba, you weren't even looking at her. And where is the same respect when you have the majority of your constituents asking for you to even talk about a ceasefire resolution, and it won't even be put on the agenda. So if you want us to respect you, please respect us as well. Ceasefire now. Folks, folks, let's, let's keep good order. Thank you very much. Madam City Clerk. Thank you. The next speaker will be Lee, followed by Bailey, then Una. I, I wonder how orderly anyone would be if their families were being 
destroyed um, as they are in Palestine. I stand in solidarity with my Palestinian neighbors, with my anti-Zionist Jewish neighbors, and ask you to respect your constituents, put a ceasefire on the agenda, and make a ceasefire statement. The majority of the country, the majority of this city, the majority of this county is in full support of a ceasefire, and it is really, it's incomprehensible at this point that that you, you refuse to do it. Um, I think it speaks to, uh, I think other speakers have, have mentioned, the relationship between not caring about Palestine is very similar to not caring about our schools. Not caring that our schools are falling apart and that I guess uh, 60 teachers are gonna get laid off because we defund our schools to fund military. We fund the military. We defund our schools. You don't protect us from billionaires who, who, who destroy families by not paying living wages. We don't have roads. You're, you're honoring women and, 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 and you're looking at us and, and we're telling you, we're watching women give birth in Palestine and you're talking about women? And then you're talking about the Red Cross and we're watching our money bomb the Red Crescent ambulances with innocent civilians? There is, there's no, there's nothing, uh, more children have died in the last five months than in five years in Germany. This, when, when I hear my, uh, my anti-Zionist Jewish friends say never again in our name, I, I know they mean it. The next speaker will be Bailey, followed by Una, then Chivas. Here. All right, hello. Uh, my name is Bailey. I'm a resident of Santa Rosa. Been here my whole life. Um, but a question I have is, what is Santa Rosa actually doing to, su to support humanitarian efforts and life-saving services? One of the gravest, most explicit human rights violations is occurring not only before our very eyes, but also on our dime. I'm sorry to say, but until you address the genocide, it'll, it'll overshadow any other work you do. Your hypocrisy glares in these empty proclamations. If you can't stand up against genocide, then your words and your leadership mean nothing. Just be on the right side of history. Like, that's all we're asking. Just cease fire now. I yield the rest of my time. The next speaker will be Una, followed by Shivas, then Ari. Hello, Santa Rosa City Council members. My name is Una Rizling Scholl. I'm a lifelong resident of Santa Rosa and a District 5 voter. Um, everyone here has pretty much said most of what I wanted to say. I'll just very quickly add that I'm a member of the Hoopa, Yurok, and Kuduk tribes of California. Um, and I'm very familiar with what genocide means. And I'm devastated that my tax dollars are going to support this current genocide wrought by Israel. Uh, you seem to have mistaken a ceasefire resolution for a political move rather than a simple statement of humanity. Your job is to provide morale to your voters during dark times, including and especially those in marginalized communities. Yet you continue to gaslight your voters and ignore the reality of local Palestinians. To illustrate my point, I'll tell you this. Last Friday, my friends and I held a fundraiser for a local Palestinian family trying to keep their family alive in Gaza. From 5 to 8 p.m. at a local small business, we had a line of people out the door in the pouring rain wanting desperately to support this family. I was told time and time again by guests that this was the first time since October 7th that they haven't felt alone that they felt that this city had been ignoring the horrors in Palestine and they were increasingly scared and angry, yet this event, organized by a bunch of broke artists, did more in one night than any of you have done since October 7th. Be the light in this darkness. Keep our votes. Adopt the ceasefire resolution. Thank you. The next speaker will be Shivas, followed by Ari, then Michael. 
Okay, I'll move on to Ari, then Michael. Hi, sorry. Like, why, why are we still here? I'm a Santa Rosa constituent, District 2. It's the intransigence of this council is baffling, baffling. Look how many people are here. You have other agenda items. People come in their suits because this is business, right? And you hear them, oh my God, you're people, you're engaged, you're curious, you have questions. And then when we speak from our hearts, when we speak about being represented, nothing, nothing, nothing. Are we gonna vote for that? Absolutely not. And, but it's beyond that, right? It's so beyond that, because we're people. <laughs> and folks in Gaza deserve to live just as much as we do. Palestinian people deserve to have their home just as much as we do. You have this little bit of power, right? This little bit of power. Why won't you use it? Why? And I've been thinking about this, like you have all the information. People have given you all of the information. It's so handed to you. It's so kind, right? And then <laughs> it's election day. And I'm thinking, and I'm like, what could possibly be getting in the way here? Is it politics? I'm truly asking, if it's politics, I want you each to look at yourselves and look at your lives. Is that worth it? Is being silent and complicit in a literal genocide, is that worth politics to you? We all will remember, the world will remember, everyone who stayed silent, thank you. The next speaker will be Michael, followed by Gary. Hi there, um, we've all heard Dr. Martin Luther King's uh, quote, famous quote that a riot is the language of the unheard. And when people, I remember during the, you know, the Black Lives Matter protests around George Floyd, um, we were hearing a lot of people condemning what was going on in the streets, which really there wasn't any violence or anything going on in the streets, but people didn't like that it was disorderly. And, and they thought we should be in these meetings more and we should try to go through the process and get things done and talk to our elected officials. And we've been doing that for weeks and absolutely nothing has happened. So I'm brought back to feeling like, why aren't we out in the streets? <laughs> we, should be, we should be really, you know, making ourselves heard because this obviously doesn't work. And I've heard the statements that like, you know, this isn't a local issue and we need to, it would be a, a, a more effective strategy would be go to the federal officials who aren't listening to us instead of asking our local officials to use their platform and voice to stand up to them. But I don't buy that. I just don't buy that. Um, I feel like that's a cop out. And I voted today for Andrew Engel because he showed up to these meetings. He thought it was important enough to, to try to get you all to pass a ceasefire resolution. Um, I voted for him over Mike Thompson because Mike Thompson supports genocide. And so to me, that's the effect that people have when they bring this kind of stuff into the local sphere where people are, where we can see them, so we know where they stand, so we know that something's gonna get done, so we know that change is gonna happen, so we don't go out in the streets and have a riot. The next speaker will be Gary. Um, I had no intention of speaking tonight, but I was moved by my fellow citizens tonight who uh, have been very passionate in what they've said. I, I had no idea this was going on these last 150 days down here. Um, but I want to applaud our city council for staying on the sidelines of what is obviously a very um, emotional issue and a tragedy uh, because it does not affect the city of Santa Rosa, although it affects obviously the people in this room deeply. And I agree with them that I would like to see an end to that conflict. I think it, I think it absolutely is a tragedy, uh, but I also think that Israel has a right to exist. I think they have a right to defend themselves and the current crisis that's going on there is 100% at the hands of Hamas, who was elected by Palestinians to lead them. And they're terrorists. And on October 7th, they 
kidnapped, killed, and raped and pillaged their way through Israel, and um, Israel has a right to defend themselves. But I don't think it's something that this council needs to uh, concern themselves with, and so I think, I think that you're doing the right thing. And I appreciate what these folks have said here tonight, and I, I agree with them that we should hopefully seek to end that conflict at some point. But the quickest way to end it would be for the Palestinians to choose better leadership. Um, perhaps, perhaps they could get let, uh, let leadership as good as our, our council here in Santa Rosa. So thank you for your time. All right. The next speaker will be sh the next speaker. Well, I'm going to circle back to see if uh, Shivas has joined the meeting. And I'm going to ask if there's anyone else wishing to speak on item 18, non-agenda matters, who has not previously spoke on non-agenda matters, to approach the podium. Please go ahead, speaker. Hello. Thank you. Uh, my name is Althea. I'm a lifelong Sonoma County resident and currently reside in Council District 2. I am here asking for a ceasefire resolution to be put on the agenda and passed. We are begging you to represent us in our call for a ceasefire. The longer you go without doing so, the more we lose faith in your integrity. One of the core values you as a city council claim. Your vision as a council is for, is for Santa Rosa to lead the North Bay, quote. Embrace this vision of leadership. Do this by listening to the plea of the people to take the step forward to add a ceasefire resolution to the agenda. 61% of voters in the U.S. are in favor of the ceasefire, including 76% Democrats, 57% Independents, and 49% of Republicans. This is not a niche issue. We do not want our tax dollars going to this. We do not want more people to die. This is within your jurisdiction the same way addressing climate, train, climate change is another one of your core issues. It takes many to address a global issue. We deserve your respect, recognition, and representation. We will advocate for ourselves and for those facing genocide. Cease fire now. Thank you. The next speaker at the West Podium, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Tamara. I'm from District 1. Uh, it was through local action from the people that ended the Vietnam War. It was only through action like this that we were able to stop that because our government didn't want to. It is up to us. If you please listen to our voices. We are telling you this is not right. Everything we learned in our lives, we know this is wrong. This is wrong and we all know it. Cease fire now. Erica is the next speaker. Public speaking is not my favorite unless I am doing it as a scientific talk. So I just want to say, first of all, thank you to everyone who is in this room, who is actively participating and listening. We appreciate you continuing to hear these comments. And I just want to speak. I feel super compelled to stand up because you really are our only hope right now. It is really difficult to find hope in this situation. And I've been writing my senators, my representatives, my partner and husband has been writing President Biden, and we don't find any responses. That's why we're talking to you at the local level, and that's why this is a local issue. The only way this is going to make it to be a federal issue is if we start to pass ceasefire resolutions in all of the towns. There's precedence for this. San Francisco has passed a ceasefire resolution. Many other towns in California have. And Santa Rosa really matters. Like people have said, it's the biggest town north of San Francisco. We really matter here. And our voices really matter and how we engage, whether it's on social media or in our communities, with my Palestinian friends who have met through this movement, they're incredibly inspiring. And if anything, I've learned so much from the Palestinian people as they're showing resilience and hope through this atrocity. Um, and more than anything, my tax dollars, I'm a constituent in Santa Rosa, my tax dollars are funding this genocide. And truly, I believe that you as city council members are our only hope and our only option right now. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker, go ahead. 
I want to thank City Council for focusing on our city needs and not adopting resolutions that will divide our community. I think many people gathered here will be happy to learn that your voice was heard. Israel has suggested a ceasefire plan for the next 40 days with the release of 40 hostages. Secretary Blinken said today, it's up to Hamas to accept an immediate ceasefire with Israel. Ceasefire could start tomorrow. You want ceasefire resolution? Hey, it's possible. Excuse me, one, one second. All right, folks, it's been a long night. Let's be well behaved until the end, please. Please continue, thank you. Ceasefire could start tomorrow if the hostages are released. There are still six American hostages held by Hamas. Peace process can begin in any meaningful way until the hostages come home. There is nothing clearer than the urgency of getting them home. Every Sunday, we walk in downtown San Rosa advocating for immediate hostage release. They're held captive for the last 150 days. Every pro ceasefire speaker here should call their Hamas representative and demand ceasefire and release of hostages instead of addressing the city council members that have no way to solve this problem. Demand ceasefire for Hamas. Demand it now by not mentioning Hamas in your speeches, calling Israel Nazis, using anti-Zionist rhetoric. You, we heard people today that they defend Hamas charter. You blame this conflict on Israelis, as we heard today, and you demand ceasefire resolution from San Rosa City Council. You just show a support of a terrorist organization. Not trying to resolve a conflict. Vice Mayor, I'm seeing no one else. Stay, folks, again, folks, again, we're right at the end. Madam, Madam City Clerk. I see no one else approaching the public or the podiums for public comment on item 18. All right. And with that, that brings us to item 19, adjournment. Thank you very much, everyone.